Bex just texted me that she's arrived at the studio. She'll be here in a few minutes. Man, is she in for a treat with today's film. For the last time, Jimmy, Jessica is my pseudo-sister. And no, I've been ignoring Twitter as of late. The non of the week's been in full swing, and I have better things to do with my time. Like archive footage of Clifford the Big Red Dog and Barugan playing fetch with Jet Jaguar. Yeah, that was weird. What do you mean, they? Becca! Jessica? I didn't know you were so huggy. I didn't know until you were gone. Oxygen? I can't. Let him go, Jess. Do I have to? Well, he's turning as blue as a squirtle, so yes. Okay. Aww, such a great family reunion. My ribs are screaming in disagreement. After the year you've had, a glomp from your little sister is nothing. You tell him, bestie. Like I was telling Jimmy a minute ago, she's... Baka, don't talk like I'm not here. Uh, you're my pseudo-sister, okay? A clone. I have a real sister, and you're not Sarah. But, 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 Nichon. Wow, dude. You need to know that ever since Jessica left the island and stayed with me and Tim, she's done nothing but talk about how much she misses you. She was bound and determined to wage a one magical girl war against the board for you. She even cried herself to sleep every night until you came back from space, thinking you were dead. And then she worked night and day with Mr. Martin to be allowed back on the island because she wanted to be with her big brother. Okay, okay, I get it. Sheesh. <sighs> Jess? I, I, uh, it's good to have you back. You missed me, didn't you? I bet you did. Yeah, like a stormtrooper misses Luke Skywalker. That metaphor doesn't even make sense. Ugh, fine. Maybe a little. I love you too, Baka. I... Is that a new bedazzled bracelet there? Oh, this? It's... It's one of the conditions for returning to the island. What do you mean? You need to tell him, Jess. The board said I could come home, but... I have to wear the security bracelet so that they know where I am at all times. And if I go anywhere near the boardroom again, they'll shock me. Jessica. That jerk George III was nice enough to have it bedazzled for me, but it doesn't make me feel any less like a criminal. Did they give you your job back? No. Why? Tour guides are volunteers, and... And they said I'm not a person. What? Why? Because... Because I'm a clone. Jess, I'm... <sighs> Come here so I can give you a hug myself. Now you know why it hurt when you said she wasn't your sister. I'm sorry, Jess. We'll go meet with Raymond to see what he can do to help after the broadcast. Thank you. In the meantime, you're welcome to hang out in the green room. You got it, Nichan. But one more thing. What? Can I sing karaoke on the show today? I I've been practicing with Mom and Sarah. I'll think about it. Okay, bye. Like David said in the Psalms. Don't. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell in unity. 
Don't we have a Gamera movie to talk about? <laughs> Shut up, Jimmy! Live from the KIJU studios in beautiful Ogasawara, this is The Monster Island Film Vault, episode 54, Bex vs. Gamera the Brave. Hello, Kaiju lovers, and welcome to the Monster Island Film Vault, a podcast seeking entertainment and enlightenment through tokusatsu. I am your host, Monster Island's very own film curator, Nate Marchand, and today is, for some people, a little bit of a sad day. For some people, it's an exciting day, but we'll get into that in a little bit, but for this special occasion. I have with me today the host of Redeemed Otaku, a raging Poketuber, which is a bit of a recent development, and apparently my pseudo-sister's best friend, Becky Bex Smith. I'm back! Oh no, (laughs) should I be scared? Hello, hello. You know, it's funny because I was listening to your intro and I think your hellos are getting longer (laughs) every time you say it. (laughs) Uh, Admittedly, I've gone back and listened to some of my older episodes, Uh the early days (laughs) of of the film vault. And I think I have to agree with you. I think they're getting Uh slightly longer. I'm also noticing an exponential increase in energy, which is saying a lot. Yes. (laughs) I would agree with that, yes. (laughs) I don't know how that works because, well, look at me. (laughs) Oh, shut up, Jimmy. (laughs) Hi, Jimmy. (laughs) Thank you, Jimmy, for your wonderful skills in transporting us. (laughs) Transporting? Shouldn't say transport, no. (laughs) Uh, Do we we really want to talk about teleport? The last time you were here, there was... Stuff with a yes. teleporter. I know, but see, it all turned out well because you know we've got Jessica here now. And, oh, yes. Jessica! Yes, yes, Yay. yes. Yay! So happy. I totally did not miss her while she was. There. <laughs> yes, but yeah, Jimmy. Thank you again. He procured for us something quite unusual. So, as you know. Jess was staying with me, right? Mm -hmm. So Jimmy called us up and told us to meet him at nowhere, Indiana, little airfield at like five in the morning. Oh boy. So we get there. Yeah, we get there. Don't know what's going to happen. It's dawn is just breaking and we see this giant yellow object, which at first we thought was the sun. But as it got closer, it was the Pikachu balloon What from the Thanksgiving Day Parade. Yes. Are you <laughs> kidding me? Jimmy, you got the, the Macy's Day Parade Pikachu balloon? Yes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you yeah, really do have the connections. He does. He does. And he, he obviously has been paying attention to... You know what I've been doing lately, which uh, is a nice touch, I must say. I mean, I'm I'm glad that he's paying attention to stuff like that because he's a top notch producer, that's for sure. Well, I've been watching some of your videos. Well, I thank you, thank yeah. you. I've, occasionally, um, I've sent you some comments. Yes, yes, you have, yes. and I appreciate that. Yes, yes. any interaction is good. <laughs> yeah, it makes <laughs> it does make me a little nostalgic. It makes me kind of sad that I got rid of the Pokemon cards that I had oh, some years ago. Heartbreak. Otherwise, I probably just would have sent them to you. Heartbreak. Yeah, I yeah. don't even remember who I gave them. to. <laughs> thankfully, thankfully, my my old Pokemon cards survived my little phase that I went through where I was like, Pokemon is bad. Burn the Pikachu. It's bad. It's evil. (laughs) You were one of those people. (laughs) I was, I had that phase and thankfully the Pokemon cards were out of my reach. So I wasn't able to burn them. (laughs) So I have them still. (laughs) Uh, I was, uh, I played the card game for a little while. And uh, what I, I, what I spent 
more time doing was actually playing the video games. Although I completely lost interest after Gen 2. Mm. So I am very lost <laughs> after Gen 2. But I spent most of my time playing Pokemon. Well, I play Pokemon Red, Yellow, and I think I had Silver, I want to say. And mm-hmm. I spent most of my time naming Pokemon after Kaiju. There you go. <laughs> there you go. I had a Charmander. I was a Charmander kid. I yeah. had a Charmander named Godzilla. Who's going to screw with a Charmander named Godzilla? <laughs> Nobody. Of course you did. Because oh. I wanted to make the early parts of the game hard. Because <laughs> that's my <better laughs> life. What is that's what you did. If you wanted the early parts of the game to be easy, you picked Bulbasaur. If you wanted a middle-of-the-road approach, you picked Squirtle. You wanted the early parts of the game to be ridiculously hard, you picked Charmander. Huh. See, I played I played the card game, and then in 2010, I think it was, I got a DS, a Nintendo DSi, and I got Pokemon Platinum. So I'm actually currently playing through Pokemon Platinum right now which is Gen 4, I think. But either way, I'm enjoying it. And yeah, I'm totally all into Pokemon right now. Are you going to correct us in your notes about whether or not we're getting these Pokemon gens right, Jimmy? <laughs> Good idea. Good. Let's, le- <laughs> let's, let the new- let's let the listeners do that for you. <sighs> But anyway, this is not a Pokemon podcast. We are here to continue the year of... Camera! Camera! Camera is really neat. Camera is filled with meat. We've been eating Camera! Shell, teeth, eyes, flames, claws, breath, scales, fun! In fact, as I already hinted at, this is the last of the year of Gamera. We, it has come to an end. Aww. You are here, Bex, to help us celebrate the finale of the oh, year I'm not of Gamera. Filler. I'm not filler this time? No, you're not filler. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Which means my sister is a product of filler. Why am I not surprised? <laughs> uh, anyway. Oh, really, Jimmy? Jessica is going to use you as her little go-between so she can yell at me. Of course she is. <laughs> go, Jess, go, Jess. <laughs> you, you, you traitor. I, hey, I've <laughs> always said that you don't skip filler because sometimes you get some of the best character development in filler. So there you go. Tell that to Naruto. Anyway. <laughs> uh, yes. The uh, Today is the finale of the year of Gamera. And we will be looking at... Gamera the Brave, which I have to be honest with you, Bex. Mm -hmm. I chose you to watch this film with me uh, because I think I really do think you're going to love it. I have I have this feeling, you know, I have this feeling. Well, you were right about the Mothra trilogy. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But as much as I love the Heisei Gamera trilogy, I do think it overshadows this movie and unfairly so. I don't want to hype it too much, but I do think it overshadows it unfairly so. For a lot of people, Gamera the Brave is just a footnote. Hmm. It's a little bit the the, uh, the redheaded stepchild because people are very... A lot of people, I don't get it, but a lot of people are nostalgic for the Showa movies, the old movies. Some of it is because they saw them on Mystery Science Theater, hence the sound cue. And then people are just floored by the just sheer magnificence of the Heisei trilogy. And then there's just little Gamera the Brave who just kind of sits there and says, hi. Yeah. I joked at the beginning of the year that there were 12 Gamera movies and four of them are good. This is one of the four. Okay. This is one of the four. Excited. Good. Of course, Jessica likes Super Monster just for Kalara. <sighs> she would. She would. If you haven't seen <laughs> Super Monster and you want to torture yourself and see some very strange magical girls, I guess watch that one, Bex. <laughs> I'm surprised you and Jessica didn't watch it. It's on Amazon Prime in the United States and on Tubi now, so why not? Anything magical girl is A-OK. Right. Anyway... <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and 
Just to let everybody know, our Toku topic, it's act, this one's actually interesting. I can't take all the credit for this Toku topic. This was actually suggested to me by my podcasting colleague, Travis Alexander, who is also my co-host on Henshin Men, the spinoff podcast that you should all be listening to after you're done listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> and he suggested that, because I was having a hard time coming up with a toku topic for this one, and he said, why not do Japanese ramen culture? Because part of the movie is set at a restaurant, and they do serve ramen there. It's not strictly a ramen restaurant, but it, ramen is served there, and I thought, you know mm -hmm. what? I'll yeah. give that a try. I was thinking either that or something with pearls, because pearls are in this a lot, too. Okay. So, I went with Japanese ramen culture, so we will be discussing that. But, in the meantime... Through the magic of editing, you will hear me read the entertaining info dump. Yes, Jimmy, you write them. Although with my contract kind of in flux right now with the <laughs> recently outed board. Booyah. <laughs> You're welcome, world. <laughs> I don't know if I'm contractually obligated to read it, but it's tradition now. So I will read that while you and I, Bex, head off to the screening room to watch the movie. Let's go! Toto, a.k.a. Gamera, is a kind and protective newborn kaiju who befriends Toru. The young, still-growing monster is intent to keep the boy safe, and by extension, everyone else in the city. He is implied to either be a reincarnation of the original Gamera or his son. The vicious and cruel Zetus is a mutant sea lizard who attacks the city and eats humans. Presumably, his motivation is to hunt for food and assert dominance over Toto. Early in the film, an old Gamera heroically battles a flock of ferocious gauss, exploding himself to kill them all and save a nearby town. The final Kenny is Toru Aizawa, a sad but adventurous boy still grieving his mother's death when he finds Toto in an egg encased inside a red pearl. He bonds with the baby turtle and does everything he can to keep his pet alive so he doesn't lose someone he loves again. The down-to-earth yet defiant Mai Nishio is the girl next door, a teenage friend of Toru who acts as a bit of a surrogate mother for him and his friends. She's battling an illness and must have a risky surgery, creating some angst for Toru. Kosuke Aizawa is Toru's hardworking and overly cautious father who runs a diner to provide for him and his son. He tries to keep Toru from risking his life to save Toto, but quickly helps his son when he sees it's possible to do so. Masaru Ichimaru Ishida and his brother Katsuya are Toru's loyal and courageous friends who accompany him on his quest to recover the Red Pearl and save Toto. The human and kaiju plotlines are at first separate, but as the film progresses, they intertwine. They never quite unify as many of the human's actions are still independent of the kaiju, but the monsters do help develop the human storyline and vice versa, creating some parallelism. Zetus is the problem. Toto, having grown larger, battles Zetus after the mutant lizard comes ashore and manages to drive him away after a tough fight. A weakened Toto is then captured by the Japanese government to be studied. Zetus attacks again later, but Toto escapes his captors to fight Zetus once more. Despite another growth spurt, he is outmatched by Zetus and ends up stuck in the side of a tower, where he is skewered by Zetus' spear-like tongue. While the JSDF does have a minor presence in the film, they do nothing but evacuate civilians during Zetus' second attack. The problem is solved when many children relay the mysterious Red Pearl to Toru, who, with the help of his dad, takes it to the top of the tower and throws it into Toto's mouth. This gives the adolescent turtle kaiju a power-up that allows him to fly and then kills Zetus with a plasma fireball. The script by Yukai Tatsui, the first and currently only woman to write a Gamera film, is a simple, coming-of-age children's adventure story with a few intertwined subplots and deep themes. While still largely traditional tokusatsu, this features more digital effects than the Heisei trilogy and was the first Gamera film made with digital photography. Digital matting in particular is used throughout to insert the suit actors into real locations that were filmed separately. Digital effects were also used for the tiny flying Toto, breath attacks, and debris inserts, among other things. That being said, practical effects are still at the heart of the film. 
A real tortoise was used a few times for Tiny Toto. The suits and miniature sets used for the kaiju scenes are impressive. Toto was redesigned to look cuter to appeal to kids. Mizuho Yoshida, who previously played Legion in Gamera 2 and Godzilla in GMK, portrays Zetus with ferocious evil. The film was largely shot on location, adding authenticity and production value. Overall, it's the most quote-unquote modern-looking entry in the franchise. The film is lighter and returns to the child-friendliness of the Showa series, but it has more gravity and touches on potent themes and emotions related to death and grief. With its mythic monsters and whimsical childlikeness, it's a fantasy film. It can be argued that the film is experimental because it sought to integrate many elements from both the Showa series and Heisei trilogy. Such sensibilities seem incompatible, but it succeeded at finding a deft balance. To that end, the film reinforces the styles of Gamera vs. Gauss with its child protagonist and lighter tone, and Gamera Guardian of the Universe with its deeper themes and often harsh presentation. Having just bought out Daiei, Katakawa greenlit this film to commemorate Gamera's 40th anniversary with a quote-unquote back-to-basics approach to return Gamera to his kid-friendly roots, in which case it was meant to entertain a child audience and perhaps nostalgic parents. Budget figures could not be found, but it was considered a box office flop when released in Japan April 29, 2006. It opened at number 6 and went on to gross 410 million yen, or approximately $2.6 million. However, it was praised by critics and many fans, particularly for the special effects and the relationship between Toru and Toto. Although, some fans have criticized it for moving away from the dark tone of the Heisei trilogy. It currently has a 6.7 with over 1,100 ratings on IMDb. It was screened once in the U.S. on June 30th, 2006 at the Egyptian Theater. In 2008, it was dubbed and released on DVD by Media Blasters under their Tokyo Shock label. There are a few forces at play. Toru wrestles with disbelief in the afterlife and vacillates between faith and naturalism. Mai battles an illness and must undergo a dangerous surgery, making her anxious and defiant toward her parents. Toru's burning desire to help Toto clashes with his father's overprotectiveness. The Monster Council is deemed an outdated organization, but resists the government's attempts to shut it down, insisting it's still relevant. Toru is torn between forging new relationships and the fear of losing someone like he did his mother. Several themes are explored in the film. Heroic self-sacrifice is exemplified by both the old Gamera and Toto. Friendship is celebrated by the kids. Virtues like kindness and bravery are displayed by many characters, particularly the children. The adults learn to listen to children and take them seriously. Toru comes to grips with his grief and learns to trust again, forming a bond with Toto. This also motivates him to help the big turtle against Zetus. By extension, both Toru and Toto, quote-unquote, grow up because of their love for one another. The year of Gamera may be coming to an end, but I can't wait to discuss this wonderful film. Time for Toku Talk! Bex, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Yes. Because... There's a lot of people listening right now, both on yes. the island and all around the world. Trust me, I know. I've looked at the analytics. But how many times did you cry? <laughs> I might need a moment. I might need a moment. Just going to say. <laughs> I mean, I know you cried at least once, but I may have not seen all of the, uh, all the times. I just, I just want to say that uh, I must be your favorite host because you <laughs> gave me the best movie to review. <laughs> I did. Why is it the best? <laughs> oh, it's wonderful. It has engaging characters. It's cute. I, I'm seriously. I think I'm. I think I just watched the live action Pokemon. I think I just. <laughs> I think this was like the live See, action Pokemon. The, movie your that Pokemon we kick. Wanted and never knew we had. Yeah, I was just say your Pokemon kick is part of the reason I asked you to do that. Well, though it's kind of accidental. I asked you to come on for this pretty early on in the year of Gamera, and then you got on your Pokemon kick, and I just thought, oh man. I am an accidental <laughs> genius. <laughs> it is. It really is. It is literally 
the live action Pokemon movie that we did not know that we had. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I am. I am just so glad. That, it is fantastic. Yeah. I, I am so glad that you enjoyed this. <laughs> like, just like, like I said, this movie gets overshadowed by the rest of this franchise, whether it's because of nostalgia or just the sheer quality. Cause you owe it to yourself, Bex watch the Heisei trilogy. It's very anime esque. You'll, I will, you'll love I will. it, but I've I don't think I've you'll, I don't think you'll love it. Those the same way that you love this one. Honestly, because I've seen a couple Gamera. The one where the two boys got in the spaceship and <laughs> the... Was there the a squid two... monster? No, it was the two ladies that oh. were going to, like, eat their brains or something. Oh, yes! Yes! <laughs> yes! Jessica had a fight with them. Yeah, okay, okay. Yes, they were the leotard ladies or whatever you called them. I can't remember what you called them. <laughs> I, I can't remember. It was so long ago. <laughs> All I remember is that they showed up to kidnap Gamera to eat him and a Crystal Lady jumped in and said yeah. no. Yeah, good job, Jess. Good job. Yeah, uh, but, uh, so I saw that one and then I saw, I think it was the very first one, but I can't remember. But anyways, I honestly don't know if... Any other Gamma movie could live up to this movie now. Oh, like jeez. <laughs> Gamma the watch Brave this. has now become the standard <laughs> by which all <laughs> others are measured. I'm just saying, you're going to tell me to go watch the trilogy, and I'm just like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> yes, Jimmy, I know I need. I still need to watch that. I haven't yet, but I know I will. It's in my queue. I, I promise I will watch it soon. Well, you kind of have to because that space squid is on the board. So, <laughs> yeah, him and his octopoidal fury. Yeah, good. Yeah. yeah, good job there, space squid. But <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh yeah. So this this movie was great. Um, I mean, just smiling the whole time, and then Genuine, crying, and then <laughs> crying, genuine laughing. I, yeah. And you know what's funny? Patrick Maceus, in his little introductory essay for this in the Gamera Arrow video set, said that this movie had low dramatic stakes. Really? And I'm sitting here thinking, did you watch the same movie? <laughs> Dude, when... Low that... dramatic stakes? Yeah, that thing, there was... I was surprised at the amount of blood <laughs> that came That's because up. it's a Gamera tradition. <laughs> So, so the you know the scene where you see the survivor in the ocean, right? Mm -hmm. And he gets pulled under, and then all this blood comes up. I was like, "Wow, that's pretty intense for a kids' movie." Well, see, and uh, well, here's the thing. Uh, I, this is what I concluded prepping uh -huh. for this podcast. And some of you listening, kaiju lovers, you might hate me for saying this, but I just set, spent a year sitting through these. OK, <laughs> the Showa Gamera movies, the original Gamera movies are childish. OK, the Heisei trilogy is for grownups. OK, and probably teenagers. So young adult, we'll say young adult. Sure. This movie is childlike and childish and childlike are not the same. This had the same feelings and emotional pulling at your heartstrings that a lot of Disney movies and Pixar, I think we were mentioning that in our pre-show or we were talking about, about Pixar in our pre-show mm -hmm. and I could sit down as an adult and enjoy this movie right along with, you know, some little kids, my nieces and nephews and get the same emotional reactions that they would get, mm -hmm. you know? So <laughs> This is really a good all around family movie for any age. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the thing I like about this is that it is the one movie that somehow finds that magic middle ground between the Showa films and the Heisei trilogy. Cause the Heisei trilogy is pretty dark, especially mm -hmm. when you get to Gamera three, it's okay. not hopeless. It's not nihilistic, but it's really dark. Okay. And this one manages to just drop itself right in between. And 
it is glorious because of it. I've gone on record as saying that Gamera the Brave is a Showa Gamera movie, but good. Hmm. Because those old ones, as much as people are nostalgic for them, they're incredibly silly. And those kid characters, shut up, Jimmy. I knew you were one of them. (laughs) Whatever. You and Masao and your Boy Scout shenanigans. But there's a reason why people coined the phrase Kenny as uh, basically a derogatory term for kids that show up in Kaiju and Tokusatsu. Media. Yeah, yeah, and it's funny because you say that. You know, I've heard, I've heard, I've been listening to the show, and I've heard that mentioned. And like I said, I've watched a couple old Gamera movies, and yeah, the kid characters are just very over the top and don't seem natural at all. No, but the kids, the kids in this movie, they felt real, like genuine. Their reactions, the way they talked to each other, they were like real kids. <laughs> they they I don't really know how were and they were it. dealing with real kid stuff you know what's really funny yeah. that our star in this movie that little boy toru oh he's adorable yeah played by rio tomioka i found out that he actually basically retired from acting right after this yeah i was looking it up and he didn't really do much of anything after that no he didn't which is yeah. unfortunate because he's good. You know how hard it is he to find really good child good. actors? <laughs> okay. He was really good, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so since we're on the subject of Toru, let's park there for a second. Because I have a fair amount of notes here on sure. little Toru. He is definitely not. I mean, I called him the quote-unquote Kenny just because it's kind of the running joke this uh, this year with the entertaining info dump. But he's mm-hmm. he's not a Kenny. The problem no. with the Kennys in the Showa movies is that they made the kids basically, a you know, adult level smart and they made all the adults dorks mm. uh, to elevate the kids. And maybe in some children's stories that works, but I don't, I generally don't care for that. Mm-hmm. But here, I mean, he has serious, like you said, he has serious believable issues and I would make the argument he's kind of a nihilist if you stop and think about it. I mean, he, the first scene he's in, him and his father are visiting his mother's grave. Yeah. And they're supposed to go there and they're supposed to pray and, you know, do the, you know, it's a very spiritual experience that they're, you know, that they're doing. Yeah. And you yeah. hear him narrating and he says, I know my mom is just ashes in the ground. Right. She's not up in heaven anywhere. And he hides it. You just see that. Like, then the next scene, he's on the beach with his buddies and they're goofing around. And he's mm-hmm. like, you leave me alone. You know, and then yeah, they and they're like, joke. dude, why are you being so rude? And then that he joke about you know, this, your mom is going to pull your pants down. <laughs> yeah. And then he he stops for a second. And then you just see him, the camera, you just see him from behind. And he turns, he's got a smile. So it's like he had to, he flipped the switch. He's like, oh man, I need to pretend I'm happy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and you're just like, you yeah, just so, was, there's so much depth to this character. Yeah, because I thought of it more as not necessarily hiding his feelings, but just showing a level of maturity that you don't typically see in kids who've lost a parent. Well, it's because he he basically forced himself to grow up. Right, right. You know, and it's, I, I thankfully was spared that as a child. I didn't lose a parent when I was a wee lad. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I don't quite have a frame of reference, but I know that it is very difficult for children to deal with the death of a parent, particularly, mm-hmm. I think, if it's a mother. You know, the, sure. And he's dealing with it, he, and it's very hard for him. That is his whole arc in this movie, is he is dealing with his grief, he's bitter and he's angry, and he's afraid of losing people. Right. He kind of keeps people a little bit at arm's length because he's afraid that he's going to lose them again. Hmm. And then Toto comes into his life. <laughs> yep. And he had, he gets really attached to Toto. And then for the whole movie, especially when Toto is putting himself in danger, at, well, we'll talk a little bit more about it later, but when Toto's putting himself in danger, he is freaked out because he's he's worried Toto is going to die fighting Z- right. uh, Zetus or he's going to quote unquote explode like the first Gamera and the flashback. Blow yourself up. He's not going to blow himself up. Yeah. Yep. And so he's mm-hmm. just, he doesn't want to lose Toto because 
Toto is very dear to him. And it's yeah. it's something that it, it, in one sense is very, it's a very child way of looking at things, but it's also something that we all understand. Even sure. as adults, we understand it. It just looks different when you're an adult. Sure. And uh, even the... Uh, the the monster's name in this we it, it's like Gamera is more like a name for the species in this yeah just the monster it's just a general name for the monsters because to Toru Toto's this not Toto. Gamera he's Toto and he's that Toto. was his mother's nickname for him yeah it's so incredibly cute <laughs> yeah there's there's like layers and layers because he asked Toto you know where's your mother. Yeah, I wonder where your mother's at. Mm-hmm. And but then he also kind of I don't want to say projects his grief for his mother onto Toto, but in a way he does. And then letting Toto fly off is kind of like his releasing that, I guess you could say that that mm-hmm. grief, letting go of that grief. Mm-hmm. And He's letting knowing, go of the fear of losing. Yeah. Uh, of yeah. Uh, of losing someone because he knows yeah. that Toto can't stay. Right. And I, my gosh, I got to tell you. I'm going to start crying. Uh, if you cry, it's don't, okay. It's don't okay. Don't make fun of me, Jess. Don't make fun of me. <laughs> I don't think Jess will make fun of you. <laughs> J- Jimmy might. But, you know, they're like, like, I think the name Toto comes from the fact that because he tries to poke the, the little Toto, uh, when he's, which was a real turtle, by the way, when they were making the movie. They had a real uh, turtle. At well, some actually, um, <laughs> That was a tortoise, not okay, a turtle. Okay, fine. So. It's a tortoise. It's a tortoise. <laughs> fine. It's a tortoise. Oh, 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 oh. Did you bring your nerd let me, glasses let me push up my today? Nerd glasses here. <laughs> uh, you know, so he's like ta 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 ta. You know, trying to right, poke him to get right. him to move, and I think that's where the name came from. And having Toto brings him joy, but he also knows my dad runs a restaurant. Right. Turtles, as. We found out listening to the commentary for Gamera Super Monster because this guy wanted to just completely derails his commentary to talk about this. Uh, <laughs> turtles are unsanitary. So he's like, I have to keep him secret. Dad won't let me keep him. It's called salmonella poisoning. <laughs> yeah, but I love him. <laughs> and <laughs> so he tries. To, so there's all those those funny scenes where he's trying to hide it. It's so endearing. Oh. The comedy's not over were, the top. It is. Those were the genuine. Those were the genuine laugh laughs where it was really cute. Well done. The <laughs> the girl, the neighbor girl, my mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, that who, by the great. way, is played by a, a by a Japanese actress slash model who is apparently so cool she only has one name. She's oh, I just, saw that. She's just Kaho. Kaho. <laughs> so I guess she's like Cher, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's Kaho. Mm-hmm. She, I think she was about 14 when she was in this movie. Okay. Which so she's actually, a little, she's a little older than Toto. And, which I, I and Toto, uh, excuse me, she's a little older than Toru. And Toru, yes. it doesn't get communicated very well in the movie. But if you look at things like the novelization and stuff, uh, Toru is, uh, has a bit of a crush on her. <laughs> Well, I liked that she was a little bit older because we've, you know, we typically have younger kids in these movies, like the Mothra trilogy. I'm going to go back to that as reference. (laughs) We have young kids and there wasn't a connection with those kids, at least in that, in, in a lot of those movies. But with my being a little bit older and kind of having to struggle with that in between stage, it actually added a little bit more depth to her character just for the fact that she was older. Mm-hmm. And it also, I think, plays into the fact that this is kind of an awkward time for boys because mm-hmm. that, uh, cause if typically speaking, <laughs> if, you know, boys and girls enter puberty at slightly different points and the girls grow up really fast when they get to it. So there's this awkward time, usually middle school where they're, yeah. you know, they're taller and look more like adults compared to the yeah. boys and the boys. And so they're just like, you're not a girl anymore. You know? And, right, right. and then after they get out of middle school and get to high school, suddenly they're like, I am a man then, now. Right. So <laughs> yeah. it's less awkward. <laughs> right. But right. so I think that kind of plays into that a little bit. Cause you know, to- Toru being a little, a little bit younger, he's probably like, Oh my gosh, <laughs> she's a girl. But yeah. you know, uh, but that, that goes back to, I, I kind of wonder if maybe he sees a little bit of his mom in her and, you know, he understands what it's like to be a parent because he's caring for Toto so much. 
Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. by the end of the movie, he actually comes to believe that his mother is watching after him. So he has this full arc by the time yeah. you get to the end. Yeah. But I will tell you one of the moments that kind of wrecked me. And I am, I am not ashamed to say this. I've said it <laughs> one other time on the show about one other movie. Mm-hmm. I am not am uh, I am not ashamed to admit that there are several scenes like with you where it takes every ounce of manly discipline <laughs> in me not to cry when usually I don't have to worry about this unless it's a Pixar movie. <laughs> but the scene when Toto tries to get rid and we the thing is we've seen movies like this all the time. This is a very tried and true boy befriends weird pet who turns out to be something that he's not. Or even right. if it's something more down to earth where it's just like I have a secret pet and I can't keep it. That sort of a right. thing. Right, right. The scene where he goes to the beach and just puts Toto on there and says, I can't keep Aww. you. And then he tries to go away. And then Toto just follows him. He just keeps coming. He just keeps coming back. He's a freaking, and little... he's like a little puppy, but he's like, but it's at least a puppy can run, yeah. you know, and keep up with you. Kind of. He's a turtle. And they're a making tortoise, the little, whatever. The little squeaking noises, whatever he's making, they're making little squeaking noises. I was like, oh, <laughs> I'm just like, no, what are you doing, movie? Because we've all yep. been there. We've all like had puppies follow us home, and we're like, I want to keep it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what are you doing yep. to me, movie? Because <laughs> I'm just like he's just a little, he's just a little tortoise. It's so cute. I just <laughs> then he nearly gets run over. <laughs> so, yeah, that and then scene. He, he goes running that's... over there, and he grabs him. He's that like, scene, I was thinking to myself. Toto about to get isekai'd by truck <laughs> Oh my gosh. But thankfully, Toru saved him. Yeah, Toru <laughs> saved him. And he's like, what are you doing? Aww. <laughs> so good. It was so uh, good. I was just like, movie, what are you doing to me? Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing to me? The, one of the scenes that really got me was after Toto's first fight with, was it, what is it, Zetas? Zetas. 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 Okay. His first fight with Zetas and the military are taking him away in the truck, in the flatbed. Oh, no. And Toru's running after him, calling to him. And it was just, that was actually a really good tugging at the heartstrings scene because it you don't, you don't know if he's going to be able to see him again. You don't know what's going to happen to him. And Toto like opens his eye and like looks at him and then the truck pulls away. And oh, man, that was really good. Yeah, it's really good. Not to derail your gushing over that scene, but I just want to share a fun little fact. Yeah. Hilariously, there was a fake news story that got spread across the Internet a few years back (laughs) that had a picture of Toru. I'm excuse me, of Toto on the that truck bed and tried to pass it off as somebody finding a 500 year old tortoise in the Amazon. (laughs) And then Snopes had to say. Well, nope. actually, that's from this movie called Gamera the Brave. Nice. So apparently what? it was so convincing, somebody thought to use it for a fake internet news story. Well, I hope that sent more people to this movie, because more people need to watch this movie. I think so. Definitely. But I do want to bring up something about Mai that I think is interesting when you're talking about her being in this kind of weird transitional period, because that's what adolescence is. I know some people look fondly on their adolescence, but then they get smart and they realize, you know what? Teenage, uh, being a teenager wasn't so fun, but it wasn't a great time. It really yeah. wasn't. <laughs> the filmmakers actually intentionally wrote her and presented her the way that they did because they wanted her to be this go between between those the boys who are mm-hmm. younger than uh, you know younger than her and Kaho actually said making the movie she's like have, ha- having them around was like having a bunch of kid brothers that she never had <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's kind of this go between between them because they're children like real yeah. real children and yeah. the adults because sometimes yeah. she would say things to them that would be like what an adult would say another time yeah. she's like Actually, yeah, you go let's go do that. <laughs> yeah, she she helps them hide Toto when he gets a little too big for the bedroom and <laughs> but then she expresses worry over I'm worried about that Toto and that Toto and I was just like, "Oh, that was such a cute scene." <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, she was great. Mhm. Yeah, she was. And I will say 
it's worth noting, and if you saw the original Gamera, you should know about this because Toshio slash Kenny, the boy in the very original Gamera movie had a pet turtle and they try yes. to imply that his pet turtle that he sets free into the ocean becomes Gamera. Um, That's the one I saw, yes. Uh, I'm going to call banana oil on that one and say no. <laughs> Mm. But it's hearkening back to that. But like I said, it's that, but good. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> so much I could go How into. did they make that turtle so darn cute? I, like, I want, a, I want that turtle. Do you want Toto? Sometime. Toto's on the I island. Want that, I want that tortoise, that little tortoise. Oh, uh, it's so cute. Uh, Toto's on the island. Oh, okay, meet, you want to meet Toto? I know what I'm doing after I'm done here. Yeah, you can go meet Toto. You and <laughs> Jessica can go see Toto because I think she likes yeah. him too. But mm. <laughs> well, now I understand the expression "Gamera." What the friend of all uh, the children? friend of all children? Yeah, that started back in the '60s. But sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I found it interesting because the movie starts with the attack, the initial attack. Mm-hmm. Uh, in 1973. 1973 with the with Gamera blowing himself up. Um, yeah, the old that, uh, the yeah. old Gamera. Which, yeah, by the that, way, I they the filmmakers did that on purpose because it's a pseudo con, uh, continuation of the end of Gamera three. Spoilers. Okay, I was going to ask you. About yeah, that. because yeah. Gamera three, which takes place in present day, the ends with Gamera about to fight a flock of gauss so gauss okay. is the only enemy that gamma not only fights more than once but it's the only one he fights in every single series of movies okay okay interesting so anyway you were saying so it starts in 1973 yeah, so, well that gamma looked prehistoric he looked old with the with the scales and the spikes and the just the like you said old yeah yeah, so I'm trying to this... see uh, the guys doing the commentary for this, uh, Keith Aiken and Bob Johnson. They mentioned what kind of a turtle that he was modeled after. I'm just trying to find it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm not seeing it. But he, but that Gamera is modeled after a particular species of turtle. Gotcha. Okay. But Toto is modeled after, I think it's called an African spurred tortoise, because that's the turtle, the live turtle that they had. Which, by the okay. way, that live turtle didn't like following directions. They never <laughs> knew what that thing was going to do. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> <laughs> what well, you were saying, continue. I'm sorry. I feel like. I yeah, yeah. You. So it was it was neat to see the differences, you know, between the old Gamera and Toto and the just the expressions on Toto with his eyes. Mm-hmm. I didn't really like, I didn't really like the teenage Toto where he had the black, all black eyes. Mm-hmm. You talk um, about when he was more like a full size tortoise. Yeah. Yeah. They're just all black. Mm-hmm. But then when he got bigger, <laughs> his eyes changed and you're like, Oh, I like that one. <laughs> he's got the he's little, nice. he's got the little <laughs> tusks, you know? Yeah. He's got the little tusks. He's cute. <laughs> yes. They did that on purpose because they wanted this Gamera to be appealing to children. The goal with this was to make a movie that both parents and kids could watch and discuss afterward. And they sure. wanted kids to like Toto. Yeah. So it's, it's made, he was designed with all of this in mind but the thing that i appreciate is that it's not so cutesy it's gross oh yeah it's not it's not so in this whole movie this could easily have been saccharin kind of like a certain movie about a big red dog (laughs) for what i understand but (laughs) although he's visiting here on the island as well so (laughs) there's that but it could have been and it wasn't and I, I, I just like thank you for finding that sweet spot where it's genuinely endearing. I'm going to keep saying yeah. that it is genuinely endearing. That is a good word, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And it's funny. I mean, like it's generally funny too. We've talked about some of the stuff already. <sighs> One of my favorite parts, actually, it's because it's a little. It actually, as weird as this sounds, it reminds me of the Little Mermaid. And that's when Ka, uh, not Kaho. It's when Toto, little Toto, is flies to the kitchen. <laughs> 
Yes. He almost ends up in the frying pan. Yes. <laughs> and then a cleaver lands right next to him. He's like, ah! And he gets, yeah. he's angry. He's like, eh! And he shoots a fireball at him. Like, eh! yes. Which is foreshadowing the end. Great. It was yeah, that was great. foreshadowing the end. And that was a fun one. Yeah. That was actually, that was actually an homage to an old Gamera movie. The one that you saw with the space ladies. Yeah. Because the... Giron has a knife Giron, head. Okay, and... that's right. <laughs> so, yeah. So it was an homage knife. to that. <laughs> but it reminded me of the scene with Sebastian trying to get away from the French chef. Le poisson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's yep. the parallelism that they do there is Toto and Toru, because Toru goes skateboarding with his friends. With his buddies. Yeah, yep. so they use that for... Uh, for some parallelism, which is uh, which is pretty nice. Also, I bought, going back to the scene where Toto gets rescued by Toru from the car. Speaking mm-hmm. as a born and raised Hoosier boy, I have saved my fair share of turtles <laughs> who try to cross the road. Yep, yep, I am that guy. I'm not joking. So if, if I'm ever back in Indiana and you're driving behind me and I see a turtle on the road, I'm gonna be that guy who's gonna hold you up in traffic because I'm gonna stop, go get the turtle. And put him on the yep. other side of the road. We've done it twice. We've done it to like a, I've done it with like a little painted box turtle thing, you know, mm-hmm. just a little one that you would see like an, at an aquarium. Mm-hmm. And then we've done it with a huge snapping turtle that oh, weighed f- probably 20 pounds. Oh my gosh. It I bet he, massive. I bet he didn't, I bet he didn't necessarily appreciate it either. He no, probably got a little aggressive. Yeah. Thankfully, the person who lives like, the neighbor or whoever was living there saw us stop and they brought us a shovel. So we just like worked him onto the shovel and got him into the grass <laughs> onto the other side. So yeah, yeah. I've done it. I've done it. I've, I've rescued mm-hmm. too. So uh, another, another one of my little funny moments, you were mentioning a funny moment. So one of mine was actually involved all four of the kids when Toto got bigger and they have to go hide him. Right. Mm-hmm. So Toru and Mai are carrying him and what's the it's Katsuya and Ishimaru sounds right so if they, you're wrong J- Jimmy will tell us okay yeah thank you Jimmy <laughs> so they're come running and the little one the littlest one which I think it was Kats- Katsuya he's like where's the flying turtle and then they all shush him like shush yeah <laughs> <laughs> it was just great it was like <laughs> oh what was that Jimmy Oh, she got the character names right. That's okay, good. Okay, thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay, I love that little part because it was just like, yeah. oh, so cute. You know, he's like, "Where's the flying turtle?" Shh. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and you know what's funny about that little turtle? Did you notice mm-hmm. that he did not have the correct roar? That is actually a bit of a sticking point for a lot of people. He oh, does I not didn't. have the classic Gamera roar. Really? Okay. In fact, our mutual friend Chris Cook told me that he found a fan edit of this movie that put in the roar. <laughs> Interesting. And hilariously, when Media Blasters dubbed the movie and released it over here, they actually wanted to dub in the classic Gamera roar, and Katakawa told them no. Huh. Why is that, do you think? They didn't say. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. The thing that is both kind of cool and a little unfortunate is that they use stock roars for Toto in this. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. But here's the funny thing. The stock roars are from King Kong 1976. <laughs> really? Yeah. And guess who huh. and guess who did those roars in 1976 for that movie? I I, I Peter Cullen. I don't, Peter Cullen. The Peter voice Cullen. of Optimus Prime. Oh, that's right. So Optimus Prime is voicing Toto. Optimus Prime is in Gamera. <laughs> wow. So, yes, stock roars. Not the real roar, but it's Optimus Prime. <laughs> yeah. How weird is that? That's funny. So, on one hand, kind of a black mark. On the other hand, Optimus Prime. <laughs> hmm, okay. Well, as somebody who's only seen two other Gamera movies and didn't know that there was a classic Gamera roar, which I should have known that because there's a classic Godzilla roar Mm -hmm. I didn't notice it and I still enjoyed the movie so Mm -hmm. there you go take that uber nerds (laughs) (laughs) like Chris Cook because Chris Cook was upset by that (laughs) take that Chris Cook (laughs) 
<laughs> you Canuck. No! Oh! 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 oh. oh. Yes, Jimmy, Uh-oh. we are going I'm to sorry. get letters. <laughs> Actually, I'm not sorry. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> well, you know something else I love about these boys? They're such boys because what do they yeah. do? What do they do when they figure out that all of this stuff is going on and they don't think the adults are going to do anything? And it's not in the in the Showa Gamera sort of way. They just said, you know what? We're going to help Toto. We're going to go on a mission, dang it. Yes, I love that. It's when they such go a marching. boy thing to do. Oh, I yes. love it. Because that's what that, boy... That- <laughs> Them marching down the like train station. I'm like, yes, <laughs> this is so good. <laughs> Seriously, it's what boys do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we're, let's go back to my hero just a little bit because I'm just looking over my notes and seeing this. Mai has her own anxieties in this. We do need to bring this up. Oh yes, we do. Yes. So Toru is dealing with the was dealing with the loss of his mother. Mm-hmm. Mai has her own anxiety. That's the thing that separates this from Showa Gamera movies is because these kids have real anxieties and they're dealing with real things. Mai mm-hmm. has to have a surgery. For what? We don't mm-hmm. know. We just know she's sick. Because that's yeah. the other Something thing that I like much. about this movie is that it doesn't over-explain things. There are some things regarding how things work with Toto and Gamera and Zetus that aren't explained in this. And you know what? I don't need it explained. Sure. They just are. I, I agree. I and never once did I in my head question the existence of Zetus, Zetus or Gamera or any of that. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. It's there's enough detail in there. Some of it's inferred, but we don't get quite all the details. Which is fine. So, you know, we know if you pay attention that when the old Gamera exploded to kill all the Gauss, a bunch of those red stones, the pearls. Right came out of him, and Toru found Toto's egg in one of them. Yep, and a giant one, a big one. Yeah, so does that mean that he's a reincarnation of Gamera, or is he the son of Gamera? I subscribe to the son of Gamera theory. So, you know, we don't know. We don't know, and it doesn't need to be explained. Yeah, and just is. We don't even know where the heck Gamera came from. (laughs) Yeah, and I I didn't really, I didn't really care. Yeah, you know, it just and Zetas? I was I was invested. That's how invested I was to mm-hmm. with this kid finding this egg. Is mm-hmm. I didn't really care how that egg came into existence. Mm-hmm. And Zetas, we have no idea where Zetas came from. Now nope. there's supplemental material that explains where he came from. Mm-hmm. In the supplemental material, they say he's a marine lizard who ate some Gauss bits and it mutated him. Okay, mm. whatever. Okay, okay, that's good to know, but. Not important. The point is that Zetus is the villain. He is very much the villain because he's one, he's a bully, and two, he eats people. He was eating people. And they don't shy away from saying, I mean, they don't, they do everything but show you people going in his mouth and being chewed. I mean, they make it very clear without showing anything, he eats people. He's evil. Yeah. You're not supposed to like him. Yep. <laughs> Even if Although he, ha- he was a cool monster. He was a cool monster because he's got his, <laughs> his, his, I called it the clever girl frill, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you're not supposed to like him. And which I think speaks to the strength of this movie. You know, you don't need to have everything explained. It would have bogged the movie down. I think. I think and, so too. But anyway, I was trying to say my has her own anxieties because she has to have a surgery. Mm-hmm. And she's a worried. We don't, again, we don't know what it's for, but she's worried she's not going to live through the surgery. Yeah. And she says that to her parents. She's like, I want to go for a walk. It's like, you shouldn't be. I was like, I want to go for a walk because I don't know if I'll see this again. Right. And they're right. like, don't worry about it. You know, they're, they're always reassuring her, but she is, she's anxious. Sure. And that makes Toru anxious because he's like, it's going to be mom all over again, you know? Yep. Yep. And so it's, I love how interconnected everything is in this. It all ties together very, very yeah. nicely. And, you know, she has her surgery and everything's fine. I kind of wonder if maybe the red stone helped. We maybe. don't know. We don't know. We, no, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. But then I guess while we're on the subject, as much as I want to talk about some other things in this, that leads to the other part that made you cry. <laughs> yeah. Because so, they figure out that 
Toto needs the red stone to give yep. him energy. And that's, that's the boy's mission. That's, that's the, the boy's mission. mission. It's like, decide. we need to take the red, we need to go get the red stone because Mai Which, has it. And then we're going to take it to Toto. So I was looking at the area that they were in. Mie province, mm-hmm. no, Mie prefecture, Shima, I think is what they, mm-hmm. the city they were in. They went to Nagoya, which I don't know how long, how far of a ride, train ride that was. But when you look at it on the map, that's quite a little trek that they made going to Nagoya. Mm-hmm. So I just want to say that. Yeah. You know, so because in, they- our, in our, we wouldn't imagine these kids going to a completely different city in the United States. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, it's always. Uh, next door, down the street, or across town, but never to a completely different city across the bay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like I said, these are boys on a mission, and they go on yeah. a quest. Yeah. <laughs> I love their boyish determination. I just really yeah. do. <laughs> so Mai has the stone. We're going to go yep. to the hospital where Mai is, and we're going to get the yep. stone. We're going to give it to Toto, and then Toto will be able to not explode and kill Zetus. And everything yep. will be fine. That's the mission. Yeah. Unfortunately, they when they get there, then the kaiju fight breaks out and they can't quite get there. But Mai figures it out. Yeah. No, actually, I think she... Well, no, she had told. mentioned it earlier, like when he gave it to her. Mm-hmm. You know, doesn't he need this? Yes. And he's like, oh, well, we'll, we'll you know, you can return it when you're... Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you're well. she knows that he needs it. Yeah. So the hospital gets evacuated. So they're basically in a shelter while the monster fight's going on. Oh my gosh. I just want to say, what kind of shelter are you in <laughs> where you have like front row seats to the monster fight that's happening across town and everybody's just standing there and like the people in the, the hospital, not the hospital, but the patients are just laying there in their bed, helpless, <laughs> the most helpless of all people. Watching this monster fight, <laughs> just like how terrifying is that? Yeah, people are it's Japan. They're used to kaiju kind of fights at this point. I mean, it made for an awesome scene, but it yeah. was just. <laughs> so anyway, she figures out. So she's like, I have to get it to. Him. So she just she does what a lot of people do in movies like this. She just rips out all the stuff. On her. She's like, I don't care if I just had surgery. I'm gonna give it to him, and they're all like, No, you can't. And then this little girl. Oh. This she little sees. girl, which, by the way, uh-huh. I found some interesting things out about this little girl. Okay. First off, that little actress, her name is Sunflower Ono. Aww. And everything's come full circle because she was in this Gamera movie. And now grown-up Sunflower Ono uh, was recently in an indie film, which is getting released by SRS Cinema very soon called Nezera 1964, which is a mockumentary about a movie that Daie tried to make, it failed miserably, and then it became the first Gamera. Really? So. That's funny. Full circle. So, little Sunflower Ono, who we don't, again, one of those things, it's not really explained. She just knows. There's no dialogue exchange between her and my she just walks up to Mai and she just looks at her and says, her Toto? Yep. And she just gives her the stone. Ooh, and then so she great. run. And then she just starts running. Uh, and then you come to the sequence that, that I can't, I, I can't lo- watch this sequence without, again, having to muster that manly discipline. Mm, uh, so good. Because... You have it ends up becoming this relay race. Mm. The little girls running around. And th- what's crazy is you have all these adults around her who are running from danger, and this little right. girl, right, who is running toward it. Yes. No one even the people are so panicked they don't even think about it. It's like there's a little girl running toward danger. Right. I mean it's that so says good. something. Like the fact that they call this movie Gamma of the Brave. I heard that the filmmakers did that on purpose because they wanted to emphasize the bravery of children. Mm. So she's running there. But then what ends up happening is that the crowd is so thick that she can't go any further and she's trapped between the crowd and a fence. And then a little boy runs up to her while she's got her arms dangling through this, this fence. I'm going to start crying. It's okay. (laughs) (laughs) And 
the, the they they make eye contact because he's reaching up to the stone and she just says for dodo and then he <laughs> takes it and runs and then the music swells and just oh man and then and what <laughs> what a, what a score man what a score yeah you, you know what's interesting about this this is we the haven't first even gone into that yet yeah. So yeah well i'll mention it just really quick this is the first and only gamma film scored by a woman oh well she did a fantastic job like i'm literally i think i might want to find that soundtrack and like download it or something it's on youtube i need i need to listen to it i'm getting it on youtube right now Oh, that's great. Yes. Her name was Yoko Ueno. Okay. And you might know this. She actually, she also did the soundtrack for Dot Hack. That is super cool. Mm Mm-hmm. And (laughs) just like the screenwriter, because the screen, this was written by a woman too, by the way. First and only time a Gamera movie was written by a woman. And uh, I'll look her, her name up here in a second, but... Uh, for what I heard in my research, she used female vocals in the music for the first Gamera's death, which that was a first. Uh, and she yeah. said adding vocals in film scores is difficult because it can distract from the dialogue. But she says with kaiju movies, they don't talk. They don't talk. You can do it. Yeah, so you can do it. And she had never done work on a kaiju film before. This was her first. Wow. Well, she did a fantastic job. That's all I got to say. I love her. <laughs> and as I mentioned, written by a woman, her name was Yutari Tatsui. And she wasn't into kaiju either, so she had to do her homework. <laughs> but she That's liked crazy. being able to write something for families. She originally wanted to do a squid monster, and then she saw Virus. Yes, Jimmy, the space squid. <laughs> and member of the board. So she decided, you know what? Sp- uh, squid's not going to... Can't do that. Nope. Can't do the squid. Try something else. (laughs) So, marine lizard. (laughs) But anyway, getting back to the relay. So then, for Toto. And then... For Toto. And then you had all of these kids who were running around. Again, being contrasted against the adults who are running away from danger. They are running into danger. And they just keep passing the stone off. And every time they do it, it was for Toto. And then they just kept going. And there's even this really striking shot later where it's another little oh, girl. Yeah. And the way it's shot, the way it's framed, the way it's lit, it looks like a post-apocalyptic city. Yeah. But you have this one very determined little girl holding that stone. Just and she over- has this, the way they filmed it, everything's dark and gray around her. Mm-hmm. And she's like this bright, shining light running mm-hmm. through the debris it was awesome yes and the whole time i'm just looking it's like stop it movie stop it <laughs> stop it <laughs> ah! <laughs> and then the movie's like okay we'll stop for a second we'll stop for a second because then they catch up with the boys yeah they catch up with the boys the the two best friends because at this point toru has found his dad and his dad's trying to be protective He's trying to be the protective dad, dad and trying to avoid risk at this point, yeah. the, which is going completely against this, the, you know, the boyish nature here. They're like, I want to run into it. And then his two best friends, they see the kid who has to something like, wait a minute. <laughs> and they go and they get it and they come back. We got it. We got it. And then that's when dad suddenly realize, uh, decides to man up, basically, and <laughs> says, okay, Toru, I see what you're doing that's- now. Let's do this. Let's do this. So they go up the building. Because at this point, <laughs> Toto, it's kind of funny out of context. He's stuck in the top of this building. Dude, the well, how he got there was That was fantastic. Aw- was awesome. Yeah, he bites, he bites he bites, he bites Zetus' tail. tail. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And Zetus climbs this building and does this somersault off the edge of the building to whip the tail around over his head and throw Toto into the building. It was really cool the suit work on zetas and on toto was amazing it was great well i should bring this up then but the guy who played zetas the suit actor Uh oh i've talked about him a couple times already on this show his name is uh, mizuho yoshida and he has also done some other important well i should say prominent suit acting he was also zerum 
from the Zerum movies. Okay. He was also Legion, well, one half of Legion in Gamera 2. And he was Godzilla in, I'm just going to use the abbreviation, GMK, because that title is ridiculously long. Huh. Okay. <laughs> Dude, six foot eight. Oh, wow. I think I know That's... why they made him Zetus. Even though the monsters in this are smaller, they're scaled down so they can make more detailed miniatures. But mm-hmm. I think they intentionally used a dude who's six foot eight because he looks huge compared to little Toto. Man, yeah. <laughs> he looks gigantic. But anyway, so he gets yeah. thrown into the building. We were talking about it. He gets thrown into the building oh, yeah. and then Toru and dad are running up there. And then they get to a point where there's a piece of debris that they can't get through because, or at least dad can't get through, but he holds it up just enough so that little Toru can get through. He just says, go son, go. And then he, he goes in there. And then that little and kid he, just acts comes, his little heart out. Here comes another cry fest. Yeah, so it's like the movie's like, okay, fine, we'll give you a little respite. We had the four Toto thing. Now we're going to make you cry again. Yep, because yep. He, he comes in there and he just speechifies to Toto. And he just tells him, it's just like, I don't want you to die. I love you. I don't yes. want you to die. Please don't die. <laughs> take this please take the stone toto go <laughs> meanwhile and why oh, the man. thing the reason this is so suspenseful is because zedis is slowly climbing the building next well, to and, him to get to him is... he even stabs because that's his crazy power he yeah. has a spear tongue which is kind of oh, like barugan and he already climbed up high enough that he could he stabbed toto with it once okay in the side yeah in the side so we have the, the the suspense of him trying to beat Zetus up there to help Toto. Yeah. And then Toru just throws the the stone at Tor uh, at Toto and he swallows it and then he falls off. Falls yeah. out of the building cuz you know cuz Zetus is already there and you're like, "Oh no." And then Toto learns to fly. <laughs> and Toto learned jet propulsion. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the cl- we've been waiting the whole dang movie for that classic Gamera bit that he can freaking fly like a flying saucer. We finally get it. Yeah. After this emotional moment, and then it's big dang hero time. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Power's up. He learned a new move. <laughs> Still wasn't easy. So it's like he shows like, gosh, what, buddy? <laughs> Oh. This, was, this was this was a major major Pokemon training <laughs> moment where you had to find the Heart Stone and use it to evolve your Toto into Gamera. <laughs> to Gamera, <laughs> Toto evolved into Gamera. <laughs> uh, and then he picks that one another fight. He's like, it's round two. Well, it's more like round three. It's like it's round three, baby. And, yep. <laughs> and. He, he blowed him up good. Oh, it was <laughs> It was great. still a it little really hard, good. but he blowed yeah. him up good. By the way, they only built one set of suit, so they, really? they blowed it up at the end. <laughs> they built one suit that they used for everything and then blew wow. it up. <laughs> that was a one-take shot. <laughs> That's crazy because they put they put that suit through a lot cuz it it did like somersaults and it fell off the bridge and mm-hmm. it did a lot of just stuff yeah <laughs> and they only had the one suit that's mm-hmm. crazy mm-hmm. and that you know so we get to the end and he he's trying he's mustering his power and he's like fireball <laughs> yes <laughs> blows Zetus up good after he snaps his tongue by the way that was oh both yeah. satisfying and a little it gross was, all at the same time it was savage it was savage <laughs> it was <laughs> but it, you can't you, you it's gross like it's something you're still sitting there like you go toto no, you, yeah. you go toto you know we've gone this entire episode and we haven't made a single wizard of oz joke <laughs> oh that's true <laughs> that, not. he's not a dog but anyway nope. <laughs> we're not in japan anymore toto <laughs> <laughs> well, there it is <laughs> there you go there I, I, I got it for you you waited the whole episode and you finally got it and, you know, yep. But he's like, she snap, it just snaps off. And you, you just know Toto's like, you know, you, you, you have been wanting to do that all movie. Time to pay. Time to pay. <laughs> it's payback time. And then he blows him up good. And then it's so funny. So you have this triumphant moment where he blows him up good. 
and he passes out. Aww. <laughs> so he's like, girl. Yeah! I think he. I think I would do. He got stabbed a couple times, thrown around, learned jet propulsion. <laughs> he did a lot. Yeah, he he did a lot, and oh man, it's so very satisfying, and it's it's so funny that that the. When you look at the filmography for this director, I mean, for one thing, I can say it actually makes sense that this was written by a woman, even though it's it focuses on a lot of boys. But Mm -hmm. there's a lot of emotional honesty in this movie. And I think the fact that it was written by a woman, I think that I think that makes sense. And then you had the director who was who was a man and Mm -hmm. his name was Ryuta Tasaki. He's done a lot of work in Tokusatsu, but it's all superhero stuff and TV. Okay. He's worked on Kamen Rider. He's worked on Super Sentai. He's even directed some Power Rangers. Well, there you but go. there's something else that's very pertinent to you and my pseudo sister. No. He Do also tell. directed a few episodes of Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon, the live action <laughs> version. Yes. <laughs> Which I'll be looking into viewing and yeah. watching. He also direct. Uh, he also apparently directed some episodes of a of what's called Cutie Honey the Live, which is not the live action movie. It was a television show. A television show, huh? And All right. you know what? He can keep it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you and I were talking a little bit about Cutie Honey beforehand, yeah, and uh, Cutie Honey is. Is infamous. Yeah. But apparently the first magical girl, so Yeah. There's that. I guess. <laughs> yeah. I guess. Just don't worry about cutie honey, just stick with Sailor Moon. Yeah. Preferably. I don't want that <laughs> awkward moment. Uh, <laughs> what are you watching? Oh. Oh. Those awkward moments where you pause the show. Yeah. No, wait. It's not always like this. Yeah. (laughs) It's actually good, I swear. (laughs) You're watching Evangelion. Oh. (laughs) But did you know that that finishing move there actually does have a name? So, you know, if you want to make a Pokemon reference, it's called Toto Impact. Oh, I like it. Toto Impact. Is that a joke? No, that's the actual name <laughs> that fans gave that, it. That is called it's called Toto oh, Impact. I was waiting okay. for I was waiting for Toto to use Toto Impact. It's super effective. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I dropped the ball, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, you dropped that Listen, one that hard. A, <laughs> not that big of a Pokemon fan. <laughs> yeah. You disappoint uh. me. Uh. <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, but yeah, uh, just some few more notes here. Uh, Zetas was a slimmer monster compared to most, which is why they put mm-hmm. all the spikes on him because they wanted to hide the human shape <laughs> on the suit. <laughs> which I think they did great. I think it was really frightening looking. Mm-hmm. I love the the set piece on the bridge because yeah. that was some great special effects on there because that was a merging of digital and practical. Yeah, and I I love the that was the storyboarding for that was interesting because Toto kind of outsmarts Zetas a little bit because he tries to stab him with his tongue yeah. and then Zetas, yep. I mean, and then Toto just looks at him and is like, oh, I see how this works, and then the next time he does it, Toto grabs the tongue, and then as Zetas is bringing it back. <laughs> <laughs> this is this crazy shot up. too his POV shot yeah. he just op- totally opens his mouth and shoots him in the face with a fireball yeah that was great that was great <laughs> and he falls off that- <laughs> so it's, this movie yeah, that was really good is scene. emotionally resonant and it's got some cool kaiju action in this do I like it quite as much as the trilogy not quite the trilogy particularly gamma 3 does edge it out a little bit for me but not by a whole lot and i just like i said it upsets me that that trilogy is just so good it overshadows this and i think Hmm. it's so unfair so 
Is this the last, the last Gamera movie? It is the last Gamera movie. The only thing that we've had since then was in 2015 for the 50th anniversary. Because this was made, they started production on this movie for the 40th anniversary. Okay. And it was this, you can find it on YouTube. It's a proof of concept movie. It's maybe, I think, like five, ten minutes long. And it was shown at a Comic-Con. It was meant to drum up interest to make a new Gamera movie. And, and no, it fell flat. Nothing Nobody. came of it, which is too bad because huh. it was actually pretty good. Interesting. Which, honestly, and as much as, you know, I've got plenty of material here for you, Jimmy. Because we you know we have a time crunch that we need to be aware of, so you've got plenty of stuff for your follow up blog. Because I always over prepare for these things. <laughs> I find I think it's appropriate. It works in this movie, and honestly, in a meta sort of way, it works with this being at least as of this broadcast, the last Gamera movie. Because what's the last line in this movie? It's, Sayonara. it's yeah, it's Toru. Toto is flying away after the kids. I might, I might add stand up to the adults because we didn't talk about this, but there's all those government guys that are yeah. trying to capture Toto. Now they don't want to do horrible things to him. They're, they want to help Toto and they do, but they also want their mitts on Toto. And then the kids are like, no, him. you yeah. can't have him. And you know, so they just get in this way. It's it, like, it starts off with Toru and then, uh, then his friends and then, all the kids little, in the neighborhood just come over and say, kids, no, yeah. they all just stand there with their arms spread. And then he starts down. It's like, Toto, fly away, fly away. Cause that's that moment where he's like, okay, now I know I can't keep you. Yeah. You have to go. And he learns to accept that Toto has to go. And I think that's also the moment that he learns to accept what happened with his mother. Yep. Yep. That's the moment where, cause that's what this movie is about. This movie is about Gamera and Toru growing up. Yeah. Literally and figuratively. And then as he's flying away with jet propulsion, because he just learned it, <laughs> little Toru looks up at him and he says, Sayonara, Gamera. Aww. Like I said, it's it works for this movie and it works in a meta sense because that was the last one. They wanted Aww. to make a sequel. There's kind of some dangling threads in the movie. They want to make sequels. But sadly, the movie underperformed at the box office. Hmm. That's too bad. I know, right? It I wonder why. Why? Was there something out at the same time that just made people not go and see this? I think really thing? what it was was that uh, they made a kaiju movie when kaiju movies just weren't popular anymore. Huh. I okay. mean, two years before this in 2004, they made Godzilla Final Wars and that flopped too. And that really? was Godzilla. So it was just timing. It was just bad timing. Yeah, it was bad timing. Huh. It's okay. really unfortunate because this movie's fantastic. I can't yeah. say that enough. And I'm going to go on record as saying this. I said this before in, a, in a, another episode. If you watch this movie and you don't like it, you are dead inside. <laughs> <laughs> There's something wrong with you. There is just, you have no soul. You have no heart. You are just. You're a monster. You are, you are a kaiju. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, have fun yeah. with your inner Zetus, okay? <laughs> I just... How? Oh, man. Yeah. I, this is full of so much heart. I, I can't yep. say that. And that's why I love this movie for different reasons than why I love the, the Heisei trilogy. And the biggest reason why is because this movie is so full of heart. And it's just... And, the, and these kids are great. And it's... It's so full of emotional resonance and honesty and is just, yeah. Is it as big and epic as that Heisei trilogy? No, but it didn't need to be. Mm -hmm. I don't think it needed to be. This is a smaller story up and, you know, after the big crazy beginning, which John LeMay said was basically perfect. And he didn't think that the rest of the movie lived up to that first scene. I love yeah. you, John, but what? <laughs> and, you know, between that and when Toto turns out to be a kaiju, it's kind of a slice of life story. Yeah. And it's a very endearing one. If it had just been a movie about a boy and his pet turtle, I would have kept watching. If it <laughs> maintained that the same <laughs> level of heart, I would have kept watching. Yep. If yep. Toto never turned into a kaiju, I would still be watching this movie. <laughs> 
I'm telling. I, I I'm telling uh, you. You agree with me, Bex? I do. I do. <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying. Yeah. Watch this movie. Dang it. Watch it. You have no excuse. Like I said, you can stream it. You can buy it from Arrow. Just please. Just go watch it. Please. I didn't have to insist that people watch the the Heisei trilogy because everybody is already watching it. Everybody in the fandom knows. Those are amazing. You need to watch this too. Hmm. Telling you. Well, thank you for having me on to review it because it was a wonderful movie. And I probably would have watched or at least not known what I was watching. You know, I probably it would not have come into my purview, I guess I should say, without you mentioning it. So, Which is yeah. a little bit of a tragedy. I mean, I couldn't even find as much stuff in all of my resources at the Sekizawa Library on it. But there's gobs of stuff on the Heisei trilogy. Hmm. There's even a little bit more about the old movies compared to this. Wow. What the heck, guys? <laughs> You're going to be the Gamera the Brave missionary. <laughs> at this point, I feel like I have to. <laughs> gonna make it known gamma the brave you need to see it anyway now that i'm done <laughs> raving about this little movie let's move on to the toku topic kenny i'm starting a podcast recruit me and co-host with attitude What the heck? I thought we put that teleporter in storage. Uh, Michael? Next time you want me on Kaiju Weekly, tell Jimmy to... Drop the act, Nathan. <laughs> this is not the Monster Island Film Vault. Okay, fine. But what's going on? I'm having you join me on The Power Trip, a journey through the Power Rangers franchise. It's a podcast version of the article series I'm writing for Kaiju Ramen Magazine. Oh, Interesting. We'll spend a year analyzing the Power Rangers franchise, dedicating an episode to each season and movie. Ah, I see. So we'll be doing an overview and talking about them in broad strokes. Exactly. We'll discuss Ranger teams, the villains, the theme songs, and so much more. Can we give out fun awards for stuff like the best fight scene and the craziest moments like I do on Henshin Men? You bet. More phenomenal. When do we start? We drop episodes every two weeks starting Tuesday, January 4th, 2022. You know what that means, Michael. It's Morphin Time. All right, so I mentioned at the top of the show that we will be talking about Japanese ramen culture, but I also just realized while that promo was playing, Bex, that you had something that you wanted to share and you didn't fully share it. So I'm going to yeah. yield the floor to you for a second, because if I don't, then my pseudo sister will probably zap me with something. But Sure, sure. Well, in between, you know, after we screened the movie... And heading back to the studio, I knew your show is about, you know, the cultural appreciations for tokusatsu. And so I wanted to look at just a touch point that they mentioned in the show, in the movie, which was the Scarlet Pearls. So I was like, oh, are Scarlet Pearls a thing? So I Googled it. And no, Scarlet Pearls are not a thing. No, they are not no. a thing. Now, I, no. I, I considered researching stuff on pearls. Like uh, There's a... Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of Ama Pearl Divers, but that was actually a thing for many years in Japan. In fact, yeah. Shiro Honda made a movie about Ama Pearl Divers. It was called The Blue Pearl. That was yeah. uh, a year before he did Godzilla. And at some point, okay. I would actually like to watch it. It sounds like a very interesting little drama. Okay. Well, since when I, once I realized the uh, Scarlet Pearl was, you know, red pearls weren't a thing, then I was like, well, let me look up, let me just Google Mie Prefecture and Pearls. And I found a pearl museum that is located in Mie Prefecture. Mm. Yeah, that and, area is known for pearls and makes they make a lot of money in the local economy off of pearls. Yeah, yeah. So it was really cool. It's called Mikimoto Pearl Island. And some of the works of art that they have that are made out of like pearls and diamonds and sapphires and they're basically replicas. There's the Himeji Castle 
the crown that's uh i think it was queen mary hmm. yeah queen mary and then there's this this other one that's the liberty bell oh which i found very interesting let me let me find it here so it's a replica of the liberty bell that was on tour in the states when world war ii broke out in 1939 it was at the new york world exposition oh wow how did i miss <laughs> that yeah so i thought that was really interesting little tidbit kind of cultural touch point specifically for this movie because they mentioned the pearl tourist industry because of the town and the scarlet Pearl pearls and i'm like huh there's the pearl museum the mikimoto pearl island so if you're ever in mm. mie prefecture you need to go check it out mm. if it's been around for that long i bet some of them were found by those ama pearl divers who are all women i might add yes mm -hmm. yes that was their job they dove into the ocean and found pearls yep mm -hmm. so there you go there's there is my little five minute research of the movie that i did <laughs> <laughs> hey oh it's always appreciated on this show <laughs> Always send me a link to that so I can put it in the show notes. Sure will. Because I always do that. So everyone can fact check me if they want, or <laughs> they can do further research on all of this. So, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about Japanese ramen culture because Ooh, let's talk about ramen. Yeah, it's actually more interesting than you might think. So, mm. and delicious. <laughs> we'll get into that. So, <laughs> Let me ask you a little something, Bex. When someone says Japanese food to you, what are the first things that come to mind? Well, I definitely think of sushi. Mm -hmm. And I definitely think of ramen. Those are the first two that come to most people's minds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and interesting thing, you want to know how big ramen is in Japan? There are 380,000 ramen restaurants in Japan. Mm. And 4,000 new ones open every year. Wow. Mm -hmm. According to Ivy Panda, which was one of the sources I looked at, quote, ramen culture is considered a vital part of the traditions, a symbol, a cult, and a trend. End quote. I believe it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of huge. So, for those who don't know, you might be thinking, what's ramen? Well, I will tell you this, Bex, if you want to get some good ramen here on Monster Island, I recommend visiting Yeti Noodles. Oh, okay. They've got uh, some pretty nice ramen here. Question. Mm -hmm. Do they serve turtle soup? Considering that Gamera is a main attraction here on the island, I'm going to go with no. <laughs> okay, good. Because I w would hope they wouldn't serve it but you know. it might be a little <laughs> no. it might be a little upsetting for toto <laughs> but anyway so ramen is a japanese dish obviously and it is wheat noodles so the thing is is ramen is a term for both a specific kind of noodles and the soup that they use for them and usually ramen is cooked with a unique recipe and there's a lot of different ingredients that go into ramen, and these but can not include turtle. but not turtle, no, not <laughs> turtle. Although I might say I like to grill some ground turkey and then put that into my ramen is delicious. Ooh. Mm -hmm. So ingredients that you see in ramen usually are things like wheat flour, salt, water, alkaline water. Apparently, that's a big deal in Japan. Hmm. Yeah, so because the water that they use for ramen in Japan is called kansui. And it's known for giving noodles their yellowish shade. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the, this water usually has a mineral salt in it. And it's considered the most suitable for preparing ramen. Because here's the thing, and we'll get into this a little bit more. We tend to think of ramen as just this everyday thing. And in Japan nowadays, it, it is. But mm -hmm. ramen, way back in the day, 100 years ago or so, it was considered a luxury item. It was oh, sure. this thing that had specialty chefs that worked really hard to make this. It was like a luxury food, basically. It's such a, it's weird, but we'll get into that. How things have shifted so much. So, and some other ingredients that you could include with this would be things like uh, shiitake mushrooms. No, Jimmy, you don't need to bleep that. And please don't tell Dr. Dorif, okay? 
anyway, or vegetables, fish, meat, eggs. I used to do the egg thing, and then I kind of discovered that I'm, you know, that eggs upset my stomach a little bit, which is kind of sad. Oh, I get that from my mother. <laughs> yeah, and then there's various seasonings and all that that you can use for it. So, did you know that there are actually four types of ramen? I did not know yeah. that. Four types of ramen soup. These are shio, tonkotsu, or tonkots, I guess. Still learning Japanese. Shoyu and miso. Now, you've probably heard miso soup before. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So shio I've is the old. i tonkotsu as well. Mm-hmm. So shio is the oldest, and it's the lightest, quote unquote lightest. While tonkotsu is prepared by boiling pork bones for yeah, hours. Pork. Mm-hmm. That's right. Mm-hmm. And it's supposed to be the most nutritious and hearty. And then shoyu is known for having extensive use of soy sauce. And miso has, well, a lot of miso seasoning. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just an actual seasoning. And the other thing that's crazy about ramen is that there are a lot of regional varieties of ramen. Like different places in Japan are known for their own special kind of ramen. And currently, sure. according to one of the sources I looked at, it said that there are 40 regional varieties of wow. ramen in Japan. It's kind of like the hot dogs in the States. Mm-hmm. Like, depending on where you're at, there's the Chicago dog, and then there's the Sonoran hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit, I guess. <laughs> so, there's actually three different stories about how ramen came to Japan because it's not a native food. It's actually Chinese. Okay. Which is kind of interesting. So it's actually an immigrant, but now it's quintessentially Japanese, which is kind of funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's how how Japan works. They take something and they make it theirs. That's what America does too, right? (laughs) Well, yeah. (laughs) That was a loaded (laughs) statement and it wasn't meant to be a loaded statement. Moving on. (laughs) <laughs> accidentally controversial. Uh, so, uh, one according to one story, a legendary feudal lord, Tokugawa Mitsukuni from the 17th century, he was credited with bringing ramen to Japan because he had a servant who advised him to improve the taste of his soup, which was called udon. That's another word you've probably heard. It's also a comic book company. They make Street Fighter comics. Yeah. <laughs> And then, according to the second story, and some people think this is one of the more likely ones, which is uh, Japanese port cities. There was a lot of stuff coming in from China, and noodle soup was part of it. came from Chinese immigrants at the end of the 19th century. And this was called Nankin Soba, or Nanjing Noodles, which is named after the capital of China. Mm-hmm. And the, But was different about that, because you, you'll see Soba or Shoba showing up. You know, in a lot of places in connection to ramen because it's it's slightly different than ramen because soba is eaten at the end of a meal. It's not the meal itself, and it doesn't okay. have all the toppings that you see in ramen. Sure. Mm-hmm. And then there's another story that actually gives specific credit to a specific guy at a specific restaurant for introducing it. Okay. Because he opened a shop called Rai Rai Ken, and it's in the Asakusa district of Japan. And the owner's name was Ozaki Kenichi. And he was a former customs officer at Yokohama. So they think he probably saw the soba noodles from China and then decided to open a restaurant using those. Okay. So it's kind of believed that those last two, a combination of those two is probably what actually did it. Kind of and, somewhere in the middle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's funny that you brought up the Pearl Museum. Did you know there's also a ramen museum? Yes. I saw that on, um, I think it was on some sort of show, cooking show I was watching. Mm -hmm. Um, There is a ramen museum, Shin Yokohama Ramen Museum, and they call themselves the world's first food amusement park. Yes. And I would love to go. So there's a lot of stuff. (laughs) <laughs> I kind of want to go too, just because it's so weird. So there's a, that's where a lot of this information is coming from. And the Rai Rai Ken was what made it distinct was that it used a lot of soy sauce based seasoning, you know, in its ramen. And that noodle soup was referred to as Shina Soba. And this will amuse you, Bex, as okay. the redeemed otaku. Here's some of the ingredients that were in this Rai Rai Ken noodle soup. Chashu, which is roasted pork, 
Mm-hmm. And then there was also boiled spinach, nori seaweed, and Naruto. <laughs> what? Naruto is the name of a fish meal cake. <laughs> huh. <laughs> Because huh. isn't isn't Naruto the show? Isn't isn't doesn't he eat ramen? Yep, I'm like get. I'll is? get to that. But yes. Okay. <laughs> so that the little <laughs> orange ninja kid is a food. <laughs> is a food. But then again, Dragon Ball Z has lots of characters whose names are puns yeah, off of Goku. food. <laughs> no, Goku, Goku is the monkey uh, king. Gohan. Yeah. Gohan. <laughs> Gohan. Gohan. Yes, you should know yeah. about Gohan because you do. Yes. You do panels about Gohan. Yes. <laughs> By that, I mean rice, not yes. the character. <laughs> yeah. So I mentioned the thing about, you know, Chinese noodles. So you had, you know, uh, some of those include stuff like chuka soba. I mentioned shina soba. And with the names basically mean, just mean Chinese noodles. And chuka soba in particular is used a lot after World War II when there was a little bit of a revival of ramen noodles. Replace shina soba because... This is funny. The political connotations of Sheena became controversial because it was the word used for China when Japan was an imperialist power. Okay. Oh, boy. (laughs) But there's no dish in China now that that resembles anything quite like Japanese ramen. So, moving on. Ramen really started to get popular in Japan in the 1920s and 30s because it was hearty and you could cook it really quick. And industrialization encouraged a lot of Japanese people to work in the cities and they didn't have time to prepare food. So they would go eat out and so they eat a lot of ramen. Yeah. And they needed nutritious food so that they could, you know, get the energy that they needed to go work really hard. It's going to work longer hours. Yep. <laughs> and it became a very essential part of Japanese urban culture. But then World War II happened. And like many things in Japan, ramen was a victim of the war because food had to be rationed and especially something I mentioned before. At this point, ramen was considered a luxury item. So they really rationed it hard Mm. during the war. I found a lot of interesting stuff in these ramen articles that talked about how bad the food shortages and starvation was at this point. Mm. But uh, to put it succinctly, 1944 to 47 was the worst period of hunger in in Japanese history. So the end of the war into... A little bit of the occupation, which okay. I've talked about in other episodes of the show, if you want more details on that. But it was not happy, to say the least. The end of the war was not, a, was not pleasant for Japan. Part of the reason for that was because the flour, the wheat flour that was used, had to be imported. Mm. Okay. That makes sense. And it was largely imported from the United States. <laughs> Awkward. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so the Fun Japanese pe- so then the Japanese a lot, hmm? a lot of the uh, rice mm-hmm. that Japanese people consume is imported from the states mm-hmm. but then what was uh, <laughs> the, the thing that was really interesting is that because of this a ramen particularly you know, uh, wheat noodles became associated with hard times but specifically mm-hmm. helping people get through hard mm-hmm. times so ramen is, a, for a lot of people, it's not so much now, but there was a time, and we'll get into it a little bit more, where ramen was a symbol of desperate times, but it also was associated with people being saved from hunger. Mm. But you know how much people loved ramen even at this point? There were black markets for it. <laughs> really? Yes, ramen black markets. <laughs> including yeah. food stands. Food stands were considered black market wow. <laughs> during the occupation. They were illegal because they were still rationing food <laughs> in the early days of the occupation. Black wow. market ramen food stands. And, you know, that's when wheat-based foods were getting really popular. So here's some more fun names for you. So stuff like yakisoba, gyoza, mm-hmm. yokonomiyaki. And they were called stamina foods because they used a lot of garlic and oil. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And then things start to shift. So we had the occupation. Things were not necessarily happy. And then we get to the 1960s and the Japanese economic miracle. 
And now, much like a lot of things in Japan, the perception of ramen starts to change. Dun, dun, dun. Ah. So. <laughs> yeah. So. Sorry, I had to interject that. <laughs> oh, you know, Jimmy, I got to have the sound effects in there. Mm-hmm. It saves me from pushing the button, right? <laughs> but the funny thing that was going on with this is that as Japan's economy was recovering from all of this, the government started popularizing Western diets. Yummy. Uh-huh. <laughs> so they started telling people that wheat that the wheat-based diet was healthier than rice than a rice-based diet. Ah, uh, uh-huh. Which rice was more the basis of traditional Japanese food for centuries. Yeah. I mean, you've talked about, you know, Gohan. <laughs> yep. Yep. And that changed the, like I said, the perception of ramen. And it became a symbol at this point, going from talking about desperate times and, you know, and, and recovering from it. Now it was becoming the symbol of Western directed culture. Hmm. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So there's some pretty insane things that were said at this point. Here's a direct quotation for it. It's a little long, but you kind of have to hear it in context. Because it's nutty. There was a Japanese authority who argued for this. Here's what said authority said. Quote, the character Saikaku of rice-eating peoples and the character of wheat-eating peoples are naturally different. Okay. Okay. You haven't lost me so far. Where the former believe that people eat because they exist, while the latter believe that people exist because they eat. Getting weirdly philosophical there. Okay. I might have to diagram that sentence a little bit, but <laughs> going, uh, he goes on. Each of these are the result of the types of food that they eat. Okay. And while the former are resigned and passive, the latter are progressive and active. What? Okay. Because of the tasty and satisfying nature of rice, peoples who eat rice easily become accustomed to that way of living and they lose their will to be active. People who consume wheat find that it alone does not taste good, which makes them desire more than they already have, motivating them to become active and providing the initiative for them to achieve progress. And the result is that they move in the direction of wanting other types of food. They need to turn the wheat into wheat flour and then to combine it with other foods such as meat and dairy products has led to many innovations that together have purchased the wheat flour based food culture of today. The relative ease of the rice based dietary lifestyle naturally leads people to move away from things such as reason, wake, thought, shiko, and contrivance koan. Scientific experimentation and develop do not advance in such a context. End quote. I mean, he's not wrong. <laughs> oh, really? You're going to give credence <laughs> to this? <laughs> well, what the party said about combining wheat with dairy and meat products. Yeah, I mean, that's delicious. <laughs> yeah, but... <laughs> Pretty sure you could do a lot of the same stuff with rice. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you can. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you've done whole panels on it. I'm going to say that again. You've done panels on this. Here's a quotation from a nutritionist from this time. Quote, parents who feed their children solely white rice are dooming them to a life of idiocy. Wow. <laughs> when one eats rice, one's brain gets worse. Wow. When one compares Japanese to Westerners, one finds that the former has an approximately 20% weaker mind than the latter. Huh. This is evidence. Science. The, <laughs> science. <laughs> this is evident from the fact that few Japanese have received the Nobel Prize. Wow. <laughs> Japan ought to completely abolish its rice patties and aim for a full bread diet, end quote. Do you realize how many logical fallacies are in this paragraph? Wow. 
Oh my gosh. Uh, okay, that, that makes my head hurt. <laughs> it's just, wow. Yeah. It just goes to show that what are scientists saying today that we'll be laughing about 50 years from now? Hey, parents, <laughs> do you give your kids white rice? They're going to grow up to be idiots. <laughs> What? Oh, man. <laughs> Apparently, you need to not have any of the rice that's served at the restaurants here in the island, Bex. Hmm. Hmm. Dooming yourself yeah. to a life of idiocy? Yeah. I love I white guess. rice. Maybe that's my problem. I, I, oh, don't be so harsh. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> okay. We get it, Jimmy. Okay. <laughs> that... Jimmy is speaking for Jessica. She's upset at uh, what you're saying. Oh, okay. Uh, she, <laughs> well. she wants you to calm down, apparently. Mm-hmm. For once, I agree. <laughs> I mean, she did spend a few weeks with me, so. I think it was more like a month, <laughs> if not longer. Uh, Better than jail, I guess, at this point. Anyway, <laughs> so besides your classic ramen soup, ramen culture has contributed another very important thing to the world. Instant noodles. Yep. Instant Which ramen. Some of my favorites. Mm-hmm. I mean, we were talking a little bit about Cowboy Bebop earlier. They like that too. Mm-hmm. I want what they had in the in the Cowboy Bebop movie where it was just like it was it was like super instant. Like you just pull a string at the bottom of the cup and it's just it's like oh, microwaves nice. in two seconds. And I'm just like Yeah. Where is that been all my life? Where is that? Yeah. Somebody invent this. Anyway, so I want you, yeah, all of you scientists here on the island, you heard me. Invent that, yep. please. Yep. So, so instant ramen was invented by Momofuku Ando in the 1950s and nice. quickly became popular outside of the country. It gave millions of people who, you know, were into ramen culture an opportunity to stick to the traditions Without investing time in cooking. <laughs> huh. And here's, how's this for crazy? Instant ramen was considered by the Japanese to be the most useful invention in Japan of the 20th century. Oh, really? Uh-huh. Because they could get not- a tasty meal in only a few minutes. And not a rice cooker? Apparently not. <laughs> huh. Although, it was rejected by the Japanese industry soon after its invention. <laughs> hmm. Did you know that you want to talk about crazy along those lines? It's not just Japan. Did you know that Mexicans buy 1 billion servings of instant ramen every year? I did not know that. Yeah. So there you go. That's how big it is. So did you know, and I've got several quotations from him. Did you know that there is actually a ramen scholar? Okay. There is a guy in he's, academia. He's not a taster? No. Okay. There is a okay. guy in academia, a professor, who has done oh. research on ramen and has written a book about it. Oh. Yeah. I have several quotations from him, as I said, and here's one of them. Quote, as Japan became industrialized and more urbanized in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Chinese restaurants and movie theaters gradually replaced the buckwheat noodle, soba, stands, and comical mm-hmm. storytelling, rakugo, performances that had previously dominated the cityscape. In this manner, ramen production and consumption became an integral component of modern urban life. End quote. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, we talked about a lot of these things that ramen symbolizes. According to Salt, George Salt is his name, it also symbolizes the generational gap. Okay. And he uses a film to illustrate this. A 1954 film, I don't know if you can get this outside of Japan, honestly. Maybe it's in the Criterion Collection. I'll look it up sometime. It's called Bakiku, which translates to late chrysanthemums. So he said, quote, one of the four main characters is a single mother who must part with her only daughter, who is soon to be married and move away with her new husband. In one of the central scenes of the film, the daughter decides to treat her mother to a meal before she leaves, taking her to a Chinese eatery. The mother, though appreciative, reminds her daughter that this is the first time the daughter has treated her to a meal. 
as the two silently eat chuka soba together. The daughter's marked enthusiasm for the dish and the mother's disdain symbolize the vastness of the generation gap. The scene makes it evident that to a middle-aged mother from a middle-class background in Japan at the time, ramen still could not be eaten without a sense of embarrassment. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And then things started to change again in the 70s. There was this thing called Datsu Sara, which meant salary man escapee. These were guys that used to work in offices, and then they would quit those jobs, and then <laughs> successful careers, and they became self-employed. Farmers, you could say, or ramen cooks. So they quit their jobs and became ramen cooks. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. And the fir- you've probably heard of Cup Ramen. That was first made in the 1970s by Nissan Food Company. Right, right. That was a big splash at the time. And that was in the 70s? It was in the 70s. Nice. That's and been then, for a while. Yep. And then in the 80s, ramen became trendy. And it went from a food for hard workers to an attribute of the generation, of the new generation. Many restaurants opened that served ramen, making it even more popular. It was eaten at cafes called Kisetens. Young urbanite customers became uh, of this stuff became known as Shinjinryu, or new breed. One of my sources says, Quote, the phenomenon of waiting in line for hours at a special ramen shop became common enough that people who did it were given a name, ramen gyuretsu, hmm. end quote. So here's another quotation related to this from Salt. Quote, ramen chefs were, were appearing on television, writing philosophical treatises and achieving celebrity <laughs> status in Japanese of popular course. culture while of their course. fans were building museums and internet forums, end quote. Wow. Yep. Started going crazy. So here's another quotation for you. Because the uh, you know these explain it a little bit better than I can, I think, sometimes. Quote, it's safe to say that Japan has no shortage of ramen joints. Recently, restaurants have evolved to become multinational chains, with one of the most notable ones being Ichiran Ramen. Around the country, its signature red, black, and green logo is immediately recognizable. Outside, it's even harder to miss, as it usually comes with long lines that stretch around entire sidewalks. Wow. Other popular... It's like going to Chick-fil-A in the United States. Oh! Yeah, I guess. <laughs> uh, other popular restaurants that have established their own followings include the Michelin starred Suta, the unique Fu Unji, I hope I said that right, Fu Unji with their gravy like sauce, and the crowd favorite Kikanbo. Despite the many variations of modern touches in terms of flavor, these ramen joints continue to make an, one common denominator it's all about the meal. End quote. So you were talking about famous ramen chains, mm-hmm. right? Chain restaurants. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. So while you were doing that, I looked up on TripAdvisor, the top ramen shop in Shima, which is located in the Mie pre- Prefecture. <gasps> Where this movie is? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it, uh, according to TripAdvisor, it is called Ajihe Ugata. Oh, so if you're ever in Mie Prefecture, you must go to the Mikimoto Pearl Museum, which I neglected to say that Mikimoto developed pearl culture. Ooh. So that's that's why that was such a famous thing, because he actually developed the way to culture pearls instead of in, instead of doing the ama diving. Ah, yes. So. Well, it's it, that's interesting because we I mentioned that they filmed the movie in places in a, you know in that location. That, and it was very well known for its pearls. They also yeah. filmed the restaurant scenes, which is why we're even talking about this, at a real restaurant. And it was a Chinese restaurant. Ah, they just modified nice. it a little very bit nice. to look like what they wanted it to. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah. So be sure to visit the Mikimoto Pearl Museum and visit the Ajihe Ugata Ramen Shop. Mm-hmm. Well, and you know what uh, is another interesting thing about ramen restaurants? It's because they mostly cater to solo diners and small groups, which is, they said, which my source says is actually really different because in most cultures, dining is a very social experience. Mm -hmm. But he says this goes back to ramen restaurants, history of catering to Japanese salarymen. So they would just Mm. have a little bit of time to go get 
something to eat, and then they would have to leave. Sure. Go back to work. Very fast-paced. So I guess if you're single in Japan, go to the ramen shops. (laughs) That were is that where people do do Japanese single people do that? Do they go do they go look for dates at the ramen restaurants? I don't know. <laughs> that sounds kind of funny, <laughs> actually. But if they're if they're only one seaters, I don't know. <laughs> you know, like a little booth. Like I've seen pictures of the little the little cubicle. Yeah. Where the person serves you the ramen, but there's a curtain like yep. you don't even see private booths. Yeah, the private booth. So you don't even see the person giving you the ramen. Mm-hmm. And you just sit there by yourself in this little mm-hmm. itty bitty booth. So, so I guess yeah. it's not a good place to go. No, <laughs> meet I don't singles. Think it would be a good place. in Japan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know if they have those here on the island. They might start renovating to add that on there. Hmm. Hmm. I'll have to go check. I haven't been to Yeti Noodles in a while. Here's the thing. We're talking about the generational attitudes toward ramen. For the older generation in Japan, ramen is a nostalgic comfort food. Well, for younger people, it's just an everyday thing. Hmm. Just an everyday thing. So according to Mr. George Salt, Salt, S-O-L-T, not salt, Salt. Okay. Quote, in the late 1990s and 2000s, however, younger ramen chefs inspired primarily by the Kawahara Shigemi Founder of the ramen shop Ipudo, I'm probably butchering most of these <laughs> Japanese names, started to wear Japanese Buddhist work clothing known as sasume, usually worn by Japanese potters and other practitioners of traditional arts. The sasume, usually in purple or black, was worn by craftsmen in 18th century Japan. The new clothing suggested that the ramen maker was now considered a Japanese craftsman with a Zen Buddhist sensibility rather than a Chinese food chef, end quote. So we were talking earlier how in the 1960s, Japan was singing the praises of Western diets. Well, now it's the opposite. (laughs) Hmm. Yep. (laughs) Now they started to argue that using ramen makes you better. One newspaper article headlined a section on on the ramen boom that said, quote, the frightening situation where plain old ramen becomes the basis for theories of Japanese superiority, end quote. (laughs) I believe the phrase you're looking for is, the tables have turned. (laughs) (laughs) We've been talking about all of the big cultural stuff, but as you were already hinting at, Bex, ramen permeates Japanese popular culture. <laughs> yep. And two things that are particularly important to you and me, anime and film. <laughs> yep. So here's a few anime and manga, I might add, that are known for having ramen as uh, very prominently in them. Kaniku Man, which I think is about wrestling, if I remember correctly. Naruto. Oh, yeah. <laughs> which I've never seen an episode of Naruto. I know I'm a big otaku, but I've never seen Naruto. You're so. also a hipster, but <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Little bit. <laughs> one Piece. Never seen One Piece. Uh, gr- uh, some of these I've not heard of, but uh, Great Teacher Onizuka. Ah, uh, that's on my watch list. Okay, I have no idea what it is. <laughs> but then there's also films like Juzo Itami's Tampopo. From 1985, and also an American film by, you know, interestingly, by Robert Allen Ackerman called Ramen Girl. It's from 2008. Hmm. And they center around ramen restaurants and cooking. Okay. And then manga. So here's some it's something called Mrs. Koizumi Loves Ramen Noodles. That is a whole manga. It's eight parts written and illustrated by somebody named Naru Narumi. I don't know this one. And it was so successful, it got made into a four-part live-action television series and a 12-episode anime. Really? Yeah. Follows a girl named Yu Osawa who befriends Koizumi, a transfer student at school. Oh, so it's a school drama. (laughs) Yippee skippy. Aren't they all? Mm -hmm. Koizumi is closed off at first, but then Yu learns of her love for ramen and uses it to get her to open up. Aww. 
So there you go. So now you're probably saying, like, I'm going to find that and watch it yeah, now. Yeah, I'm going to look it up. I'm going to look it up. <laughs> did you know the manga that uh, Toru had? No, I did not. Yeah. What was it? Sergeant Frog. <laughs> That was the that was the manga that May gave him. Ah, gave when him she when she was being read. a little bit a little bit yeah. mean about it. Yeah, <laughs> Sergeant Frog. Why are we always? Why are people always mean to the people they like? <laughs> yeah, just weird, especially in anime. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mentioned George Salt. The name of his book, should have mentioned this earlier, The Untold History of Ramen, How Political Crisis in Japan Spawned a Global Food Craze. So if you ever want to look it up, there you go. And That's he actually cool. said that there are eight types of ramen books, and he listed them all out. Huh. And these are ramen guidebooks, manuals for quote-unquote would-be entrepreneurs, graphic novels and fiction, autobiographies of celebrity ramen chefs, <laughs> books studying historical development of ramen culture, books studying the representation of ramen in popular culture, works using ramen to comment on social issues. So social commentaries with ramen. Yeah. <laughs> wow. This is intriguing. Yeah. And the sources aimed to explain the origins and of po- of the popularity of ramen. So apparently there is an entire sector of social science, sociology, dedicated to ramen. Yeah. And the funny thing is, George Salt says he actually prefers soba. He prefers soba. He spends Side all note. this time researching Side ramen and he note. prefers soba. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. Oh, and that museum I mentioned, it recreates a 1958 townscape and gets millions of people to come over to try different variations of ramen from all over the country. Yeah. And there's also, uh, near Yokohama, there's a cup noodles museum. So they have one too. Yeah. (laughs) And if you're you're ever in Tokyo around late October, early November, they have... The Tokyo Ramen, ramen Show. It's a food festival. Yes. In 2020, they hosted 18 ramen vendors for the oh, first six man. days. And then a completely different set of 18 ramen vendors for, for the last five days. Wow. <laughs> Which gave you 36 different ramen shops to try. Wow. That's more than anybody could try. You couldn't even try it all. I'm sure someone would, just, would try, though. There's just no way. You couldn't do it. Yeah, someone would try. You know someone would try. Yeah. But they'd probably die. <laughs> <laughs> of ramen poisoning or something. <laughs> ramen poisoning. <laughs> Naruto's in trouble. <laughs> I think ramen's the source of his power. <laughs> that sounds like a manga thing, doesn't it? Like a shonen jump, you know, manga thing. <laughs> the hero gets his superpowers from ramen. He has from to eat ramen, ramen every day. <laughs> I wouldn't hate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you want to know how crazy this is? I found a tagline for a ramen restaurant. It's called Samurai Noodles. Mm-hmm. Here is their tagline. I found God, period. He's in a bowl of noodles at Samurai Noodles. Wow. Which reminds me of Firefly. <laughs> There's, I don't know if you've seen Firefly. There's something like that in Firefly. Uh, it's been a long time. Because Book says that he found God in a bowl of soup. Okay. And then you have to read the comic to find out how that happened. Because the show got canceled! Screw you, Fox! Anyway. I'm not going to let you live that down. <laughs> I'm not going to let you live that down. That was a better live-action Cowboy Bebop than the actual live-action Cowboy Bebop. Oh, hot take of the day. He said it. He said it. And then finally, finally, (laughs) just wanted to let everybody know, this is how you know. This, friends, is how you know you've hit uh, that this is a cultural phenomenon. There is a ramen cup Funko Pop. (laughs) And I found pictures of it. It's a limited edition. Uh, And you want to know what his name is? Rami. Nope. That's too obvious. (laughs) They had to go with slightly (laughs) less obvious. Nissan. No. (laughs) 
His name is Oodles. Oodles. <laughs> uh, that's too funny. Well, there you go. Oodles of Noodles is a Funko Pop. Wow. And Gamera isn't? Nope. Wow. I demand a Gamera Funko that's Pop. That's a miss. That's there's, a big miss. There's some defo reels of Gamera, <sighs> but I want a Funko Pop. I have Funko yeah. Godzillas. I have yeah. Funko Kongs. Where's my Gamera? Right? Where's my Gamera? I have Funko get, Ultraman I'll, too, so where's my Gamera? I'll get you a Funko Blastoise. <laughs> That's the closest I <laughs> and can slap get. A, slap a little sticker on there and says Gamera. <laughs> it's, I'm actually a Gamera. <laughs> Except he uses water, not fire. Which, which, by the way, Jimmy, I just want to say... I loved the Pikachu balloon, but it was a little slow getting here. So maybe you can like feed it a heart stone or something and give it some jet propulsion for our <clears throat> for my trip back. Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I didn't know he could do that. Putting jets on a <laughs> balloon might be a little dangerous. <laughs> I'm sure Jimmy will figure it out. I'm sure it's, all, will. it's okay. It'll be the the Pikachu Zeppelin. <laughs> <laughs> Pikachu Zeppelin. That that sounds like the name of a band. <laughs> That'd be pretty awesome. Sounds like a band. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. All righty then, Bex. Uh, we got a lot of stuff for you to do after yeah. we're done here, you and Jess. So yep. let's wrap this up. So normally. <laughs> this would be the part where up until you know a few, uh, a few months ago i would have to read some bored propaganda but i don't have any however Yay. there have been some interesting things happening on twitter just wanted to make everyone aware of it apparently one of the matongo men escaped from dr Dorf's lab oh boy and the board is apparently too busy to see this because even though dr Dorf put it on freaking twitter <laughs> Uh, but thankfully, we were able to capture the escaped Matongo man, and everything is fine. The EDF mutants took care of it. Wow. However, some strange things were going on with that Dr. Dorf Twitter account. I'm not even sure he remembers having it to the point where we're not even sure that it was Dr. Dorf. So there's an investigation that is being launched to figure out what is happening. Hmm. But everything seems to be okay, other than the strange mushroom pictures that he's been posting. Some of which I'm not sure are family friendly. So, just keeping you up on that. But uh, yeah, have fun, boardies, with that. I look forward to you getting thrown into jail. Or maybe we'll shoot you into space like you did me. Ha! Dang supervillains. <laughs> uh, anyway, now, Bex, it's time for yes. the fun part. One of my favorite Yay. segments of the show. Are you ready? Yay. This is your I've first time. Why was it? I didn't. I, this segment didn't exist the last time you came. Are you ready? I know. I'm excited. You know what it is? Yes. It's the patron shout outs. Go show a good aside. Travis Alexander. Michael Hamilton. Danny Demena. Eli Harris! Chris Cook! Damon Noise! Me from Redeemed Otaku! The Cellcast! Elijah Thomas! Tofu Fury! <laughs> Do you feel like an anime character now? <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> oh, man. That, uh, there's a reason why that is one of my favorite segments now. That is great. Uh, all right. So in our final minutes of today's broadcast, I need to let everybody know, yes, this is the end of the year of Gamera, which Aww. means... Our next episode is the season finale. I can't believe it. It's the Ooh. second season finale. That's weird for me. <laughs> that is crazy. That is nutty. And what is it? I, I don't know yet because it's a Patreon-sponsored episode from Michael Hamilton, and he hasn't told me what it is yet. 
He oh. teased it a little bit in the last episode. He says everyone will be green with envy. I don't know what Uh-oh. exactly that's supposed to mean, but that's it was his little hint. So I guess we'll wait and see. I'll probably be just as surprised as all the rest of you. And I also want to bring this up. I've been mentioning that <laughs> I've been you know poking even more fun at the board because I can, because I outed him. Well, they have been trying to play nice with me quite a bit the last few months, but I don't trust them. One of the things that they offered was to throw me a dinner. I could have whoever I wanted over. So I've made up my mind. I'm going to announce it here on the show. As I know you're listening, bored. Looking at you, (laughs) WHG3. I don't just want to have any dinner. No. I want a Christmas banquet. And I want all of my podcast friends and guests from the show to come back for this Christmas banquet. So you're invited, Bex. Nice. And I guess so is Jessica. But Question. What? Question. Did they use the word specifically throw you a dinner? Because what I had imagined when you said that was them actually flinging like a bowl of ramen at you and saying, hey, we're throwing you a dinner. Don't give them ideas. (laughs) (laughs) don't make me hate you bex anyway (laughs) so there's that but bex yes i have a very important announcement to make because season three is coming up right yeah everyone's probably wondering well i've talked about kong i'm going through the godzilla films i've talked about gamera for an entire year yeah. What am I doing next? Next season on the Monster Island Film Vault, we're not going to be talking about a specific franchise or a specific monster. We're going to be talking about kaiju films made in a particular country, Bex. I'm calling it Kaiju. We're going to talk about oh, mo- nice. giant monster movies made in the good old U.S. of A. All right. And as the music probably gives away, one of them, yes, will be Pacific Rim. I will bring that up. I'll say that much at least. The full list is on the website, and I've posted. It's been posted on social media. You can see the whole list there. I've got some really fun and cool guests lined up, including you. I might add. <laughs> Do we want to tell everybody what you're going to be coming back to talk about? Sure, we'll be doing the not heard of Atlantic Rim. Uh, Fake news? (laughs) (laughs) No, look it up sometime. uh, Look it up sometime. It's it's It's, called Atlantic Rim. (laughs) It's it's real. And it hurts. No, I'm bringing you back to talk about a funny little movie that nobody's heard of called Jurassic Park. (laughs) Because unfortunately... Yeah, because unfortunately, I feel like I've kind of gotten you a little bit pigeonholed. I keep bringing you back to talk about things that involve girls and kids. So we're branching out a little bit, but not really because there's kids in that one. There's still girls and kids. (laughs) (laughs) Whoops. (laughs) I've got you pigeonholed, unfortunately, as a guest. (laughs) I'm sorry. Or should I be? That's all right. (laughs) It's all right. Uh, But yes. I'm my time. But yes, uh, it's going to be fun, really fun, and I'm looking forward to it, and I hope all the rest of you are as well, like I said. So just to rattle off a couple more, so Pacific Rim, Jurassic Park, and uh, we won't spend the entire time in the 50s. It would be very easy to spend the entire season talking about 50s B-movies, but we will get a few of them in there, uh, most notably, and although I don't call this a B-movie, but we'll have Them, which is about giant ants. Ooh. Mm-hmm. It's actually considered a genuine classic. So, okay. and uh, my guest for that one will be John LeMay. So, who's actually lives in where the movie takes place. So, ooh, yeah, New Mexico. So, 
it'll be exciting. No. Very, very exciting. But, Bex, now that the music is over, <laughs> it's time for you to complete this episode of MIFV by doing your shameless self-promotion. Yay! Well, once again, my name is Bex, and I'm the host of the Redeemed Otaku podcast, which we are currently on a hiatus, but we will be making a grand return very soon. I think uh, the term you're looking for is second coming. Second coming? <laughs> I expect trumpets. I will be very disappointed if there are no trumpets. <laughs> Uh, but in the meantime, you can check me out on YouTube. I've been doing a, some fun videos of card openings, mainly Pokemon, but we've been branching out into some Magic the Gathering as well. So Ooh. if you like that kind of stuff, go follow us on YouTube, Redeemed Otaku. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube now. So there you go. All righty then. And by the way. Please, we didn't have any listener feedback this week, so please send listener feedback. We love listener feedback. We always mm -hmm. read the listener feedback on here. Or leave reviews for the show. We read the reviews as well. So, mm -hmm. you want to be a part of the show? Send us some feedback. We'd love to hear from you. Oh, what now, Jimmy? Not so fast, Wanda. Who said I could sing on the show? No, I said I'd think about it, and... When you and Bexy mentioned Sailor Moon, I knew exactly what song I wanted to do. Oh, no. Oh, yes. I've got it pulled up right here on my phone. Oh, hello, kaiju lovers. In the name of the moon, I'll sing for you. Fighting evil by moonlight Winning love by daylight Never running from a real fight She is the one named Sailor Moon She will never turn her back on a friend She is always there to defend She is the one on whom we can depend She is the one named Sailor Sailor Venus Sailor Mercury Sailor Mars, Sailor Jupiter, secret powers also new to her, she is the one named Sailor Moon. I should learn how to play guitar. Fighting evil by moonlight. Winning love by daylight With her sailor scouts to help fight She is the one named Sailor Moon She is the one named Sailor She is the one Sailor Moon Bravo! Bravo! I love it! I love it! Wow, Jess, that was surprisingly good. I had no idea you could sing. If you'd come with me to karaoke night at the resort a little more often, you know that I could give the Shobajin a run for their money. Oh, speaking of which, they're going to teach me how to summon Mothra by singing. <gasps> can I come too? They better let you or they'll have to deal with Crystal Lady. <laughs> You're darn right they're going to have to deal with Crystal Lady. Betsy, we should go and do karaoke tomorrow night. I'm game. Maybe we could have them add the Mothra song to their karaoke machine. Yeah. I mean, I, I know the song already, but it was under embarrassing circumstances. Oh, Mothrianity. I mean, I would just love to just spend time with the Shobajin. Oh, Maybe good Godzilla. Cue credits, that Jimmy. Awesome. Thank you for listening to the Monster Island Film Vault, a podcast produced and hosted by Nate Marchand. If you enjoy the show and want to join the discussion, we'd love to hear from you. So email us at feedback at monsterislandfilmvault.com. Your message could be read on a future episode of the show. Our website is monsterislandfilmvault.com. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Monster Island Film Vault and on Twitter, where our handle is at the Monster Isla One. You can also follow Jimmy from NASA on Twitter at NASA Jimmy and the Monster Island Board of Directors at 
Monster is for BOD. I have fulfilled my contractual obligations. And be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube, Spotify, and Twitch. The podcast logo was created by Tyler Souls from TylerDrawsComics.com. Our theme song is Wanderer on the Offensive, live edit by B33J, Sarax, Juan Madrano, and Nonsensical Lexus, which is a remix of Counterattack, Battle with the Colossus, and The Open Way, Battle with the Colossus by Koatani from the video game Shadow of the Colossus. All film and audio clips belong to the respective copyright holders, and no infringement is intended or implied. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and or Podchaser to spread the word about the show. You can also support us by joining MIFV Max on Patreon. The Monster Island Film Vault is a Moonlighting Ninjas Media production. Sayonara!